One rainy day in the mid-1930s, a peculiar young officer smartly paraded up to the front of his platoon's formation and snapped into place with full military precision. Unlike the rest of his platoon, however, this particular officer was carrying an umbrella. Red in the face with anger and dripping wet in rain, the battalion adjutant immediately stormed over and demanded to know what in the blue blazes the officer was thinking carrying an umbrella to formation. Without missing a beat, the young officer simply responded, because it's raining, sir. John Malcolm Thorpe Fleming Churchill, or as he would later be known, Mad Jack or Fighting Jack, would be immediately reprimanded for his insubordination and preposterousness. But such reprimands were nothing new for the very bored officer. Amidst the brief interlude of peace between World War I and World War II, Churchill found his military service, well, rather dull. A rare breed of man practically born to lead others on the battlefield, Churchill itched for excitement and chaos. When life failed to provide any, he sought it out himself, and at a time when roads were mostly non-existent in India, rode his motorcycle over 1,500 miles of the Southeast Asian countryside, often crossing rivers and chasms by pushing his bike along the rails of railroad tracks while he carefully stepped across the crossbeams. To ease his peacetime boredom, Churchill also taught himself how to play the bagpipes, which at the time was not a particularly popular pastime for proper British men. But not one to half-ass anything, Churchill not only learned to play the bagpipes, he would go on to play second in the officer's class of the piping championships at Aldershot, a stunning feat considering he was the only Englishman amongst the 70 or so competitors. Bagpipes mastered, Churchill also took up a keen interest in archery and became such a proficient archer that he would go on to represent England in an international tournament. Churchill may have been a daredevil and an adrenaline junkie, but that didn't mean he disliked comfort. Quite the opposite. Not only would Churchill earn himself a reprimand for bringing an umbrella to military formation in the pouring rain, but he also was chastised for using a hot water bottle to keep warm at night in his cot, against military protocol. To bypass this minor technicality, Churchill instead used a piece of rubber tubing which he filled with hot water. The regs, after all, forbade the use of hot water bottles, but said nothing about rubber tubes. While most military men measure their alleged toughness by their ability to suffer hardship, Churchill saw no need for such inane displays of machismo, or perhaps he was, as many sources state, bored out of his mind by peace and entertained himself by annoying his senior leadership. Whatever the truth, if anyone thought Churchill was a soft man because he preferred to stay dry in the rain and sleep in warm comfort, they would be sorely mistaken, as the world was about to find out with the outbreak of World War II. In 1939, the German army invaded Poland from one side as the Russians invaded from another. Polish defenders were caught between the two surging armies and quickly surrendered. The hostilities prompted Britain and France to declare war on Germany, and at last Churchill's long stretch of peacetime boredom came to an end, commenting that I was back in my red coat, the country having gotten to a jam in my absence. Churchill left behind his brief peacetime life of modeling and appearing in famous films as an extra to ship out to France. However, a Upon arriving, Churchill was immediately disappointed. Despite German aggression against the Poles and Britain and France's declaration of war, both nations simply took up positions along the French Maginot Line and did, well, nothing. Troops simply held their ground and generally tried not to be bored for weeks upon weeks, the lack of offensive operations being the result of Britain and France's lack of preparations for war, what historians would end up calling a slight oversight. Britain and France had completely failed to fully prepare for conflict, despite years of ratcheting German aggression and a whole lot of angry, tiny mustache chest-pounding from Adolf Hitler. Whatever the case, Churchill found himself a victim of Allied unreadiness, a situation which did not suit him at all. There was a war on, damn it, and like a puppy straining on the leash, Churchill wanted his share of it. With the Soviets invading Finland, Churchill joined a volunteer detachment of British soldiers sent to aid Finn forces. They might not be Germans, but fighting anyone who was being an international dick was better than fighting nobody, Churchill supposed. Bidding his comrades adieu, Churchill joined the Finnish detachment, but before the expedition could get all the way to Finland, it was cancelled on account of some sudden and very severe German rudeness across the entire Maginot Line. Finland would have to fend for itself against the Soviets. At last, the proper war was on. 
Returning to his comrades, Churchill was immediately displeased at the British Army's failure to hold its ground against the overwhelming German blitzkrieg of tens of thousands of infantry, thousands of tanks, and an equal number of fighters and bombers. Churchill and his unit were then ordered to retreat, making for Dunkirk, where rescue awaited for the overwhelmed British and French forces. And if that rescue failed, the war could come to a very sudden and unpleasant end for the Allies. More than a fair bit annoyed at having to retreat, Churchill decided to creatively reinterpret his orders, and rather than simply fall back en masse, he engaged in an aggressive campaign of guerrilla raids and counterattacks against the German forces, leading small teams of hand-picked men. Churchill would rush, roaring a battle cry into battle, holding aloft a large two-handed sword. Like some anachronistic Highlander, Churchill waded into enemy fire and on more than one occasion spitted a German soldier on his claymore. Other times, Churchill would discard his rifle in favor of his longbow, sinking barbed shafts into the chests of Germans up to a hundred yards away. Rumor has it that during one battle, a German officer asked for a list of casualties and injuries, only to be told that several of the casualties had been shot with arrows. The confused and irate officer warned his junior officer not to joke around with him, only to be shown the bodies with arrows still sticking out of them. Professional soldiers always expect the unexpected in combat, but nobody expected a mad Englishman shooting arrows in the midst of the greatest industrial age war in human history. During a lull in the fighting, Mad Jack Churchill, as he was now known, was spotted by a fellow officer riding his signature motorcycle, longbow on his back, arrows sticking out of packs strapped to his body, and a German officer's cap on the motorcycle's headlamp. As Mad Jack dismounted, the officer noted a streak of blood across his ear and neck, and asked about the fresh injury. Asking for a stiff drink in return, Churchill responded that he and his men had ran into a German machine gun, and his men had screamed for him to run, but he had simply been too tired to. Churchill had thought it's simpler to destroy the machine gun nest, even after being shot through the neck. Successfully making it across the channel back to England, Churchill got wind of a new military organization organization being formed, called the Commandos. The request for volunteers was secretive, but promised aggressive military service, which was more than good enough for Churchill. The progenitors to Britain's modern special forces, commando service included weeks of training in demolitions, firearms, infiltration, and all manner of other topics which Churchill absolutely adored. During commando training, however, Churchill also met a woman, whom he would immediately marry and remain happily married to for 55 years until his death. On December 27, 1941, Churchill had his chance to rejoin the war as the newly formed commandos assaulted the German garrison at Volksoy in Norway. Tasked with destroying the onshore artillery in preparation for a full-scale assault, Churchill stood in the lead landing craft with bagpipes, belting out the march of the Cameron men as enemy machine guns strafed the oncoming boats. As soon as the ramps lowered, Churchill waded ashore ahead of his men, holding aloft his sword and, as one soldier put it, uttering warlike cries. A half hour later, Churchill sent out a brief telegraph to headquarters, reading simply, Malloy Battery and Island Captured, Casualties Slight, Demolitions in Progress, Churchill. Churchill would go on to win several military honors, as well as more than a few battle scars. But his greatest feats of valor would not come until the autumn of 1943, leading the Allied landings at Salerno in Italy. Churchill and his commandos found themselves fighting alongside American Rangers in the town of Marina. Both Churchill's commandos and the American Rangers were not designed to fight and operate as normal line infantry, lacking much of the heavy fire support that normal infantry brings to a fight, such as heavy machine guns and mortars. Armed mostly with rifles and grenades so that they could remain mobile, the commandos and rangers found themselves at a severe disadvantage as German and Italian heavy infantry assaulted their position in waves. Though casualties were extremely high, the Allied forces beat back every assault. Growing bored of simply waiting for the Germans to come to him to get shot, Churchill decided it would be best to go where they were instead and shoot them there. Ignoring the fact that his forces were grossly outnumbered and had no heavy weapons and absolutely zero support, Churchill led a night raid against a heavily defended German position, rushing out from thick undergrowth and shouting commando. Churchill and his small detachment destroyed the German position and took 136 prisoners. Churchill and one of his corporals, however, had managed to get themselves far ahead of the rest of their unit in the fighting, and suddenly heard the sound of dozens of Germans digging into fighting positions all around them in the nighttime darkness. Never one to waste a good opportunity, Churchill decided that it wouldn't do to march back to friendly lines alone, and instead unsheathed his giant sword and simply walked to the first German position, ordering the men to put their hands up in German. 
perhaps thinking themselves visited by the ghost of an ancient medieval man, or simply doubting that even their bullets would touch a man with balls of steel so sturdy he waded into battle carrying a giant freaking sword. The Germans obliged and were taken prisoner. Churchill, however, wasn't done. He thought it wouldn't do for his German prisoners to be lonely, and thus decided to visit another German position. By the end of the night, Churchill and his corporal took 42 German prisoners, leading them back to the British and American lines at Sword Point. Churchill would go on to explain to a senior officer that as long as you tell a German loudly and clearly what to do, if you're senior to him, he will cry, Jawohl, and get on with it enthusiastically and efficiently, whatever the situation. That's why they make such marvelous soldiers. A few months later, however, Churchill himself would be taken prisoner, surrounded on all sides by Germans and with just six men and himself left alive, and with nothing more than revolvers and a single American carbine between them. Churchill fought on until the ammunition ran out, and a mortar killed three of his other men and wounded another. With nothing left to shoot back with, and apparently separated from his trusty sword, Churchill pulled out his bagpipes and prepared to meet his end, playing Will Ye No Come Back Again, until a German grenade knocked him unconscious. Churchill would be sent to a POW camp, but was quickly growing bored of not killing Germans. He hastily made an escape. Upon his recapture, he was sent to an even more well-guarded POW camp, only to escape again. Meeting up with a column of American armor, Churchill was rescued but appalled to hear that the war was nearly over. Returning to his unit, Churchill commented, there are still nips, aren't there? And thus, Churchill volunteered to ship off to the Pacific. Sadly for Churchill, upon his arrival, the Americans dropped their second nuclear bomb, and the Japanese quickly surrendered. A heartbroken Churchill would go on to say to a friend, if it hadn't been for those damned Yanks, we could have kept the war going on for another 10 years. Telling another friend that the Japanese had double-crossed him by surrendering, Churchill immediately began to look for an opportunity to join the many brush wars raging in the aftermath of World War II. He got his chance in 1948, when Arab forces tried to drive the Jews from what would become Israel. Present in his full-dress uniform at a battalion parade, Churchill got news that a Jewish medical convoy had been ambushed by Arab forces. Not wasting a moment, Churchill immediately rushed to their aid, still wearing full-dress uniform, boldly rushing down the middle of the road and into the teeth of the battle, Churchill commented later that I grin like mad from side to side, as people are less likely to shoot you if you smile at them. Churchill would go on to rescue 700 Jewish civilians and earn greater military honors for his deeds. At the end of the hostilities, Churchill then went to teach at various military schools, ending his career while serving as an instructor at the Land Air Warfare School in Australia. Giving up on its many attempts to kill him, life would let Churchill live out his days happily next to his wife until his peaceful death in 1996, leaving behind an extraordinary legacy of courage and, well, no small amount of lunacy. Best remembered for his signature claymore which he waded into battle with, Churchill once answered a general awarding him a decoration who asked about the weapon by saying, in my opinion sir, any officer who goes into action without his sword is improperly dressed. This video is sponsored by Warpath, the free-to-play war strategy mobile game that combines real-time strategy with the real history of World War II. Breaking news, the world is at war once again and we need you to take command and bring your leadership skills to real battles, like the landings at Normandy and the defense of Moscow. This is the most historically accurate war strategy game on mobile and you'll need to make clever use of everything from small arms to tanks to warplanes to lead your side to victory. Thanks to the latest Warpath update, the battle in the skies is more important than ever. There are 42 new fighter and bomber units for you to use, which you can enhance and modify as you see fit to assert your air superiority over your forces. But most exciting of all is that Jean-Claude Van Damme has arrived in Warpath and the action star has brought incredible rewards. Be sure to find him in-game to unlock your exclusive commanders and aircraft units. So what are you waiting for? Click on the link in the description to download Warpath for yourself. And make sure to use my code since Infographics Show viewers also get a special gift that includes gold, oil, steel, and army experience worth $10 that you can use to gain an advantage in the coming war. World War II is undoubtedly the deadliest and most brutal conflict this world has ever seen. Even if massive battles with millions of casualties, genocide, and the mass suffering of hundreds of millions of people were not enough, there were various weapons employed by all sides that magnified the carnage by an immeasurable magnitude. Ethics aside, these weapons are included in this list due to their known ability to cause damage, with a list of theoretical weapons reserved for another time. What makes any particular one of these weapons so terrifying is either through the suffering they caused victims, their effectiveness on the battlefield, or their ability to defeat countermeasures. But without further ado, here are some of the most terrifying weapons of World War II. Kamikazes 
As the war in the Pacific turned ever worse for Japan, they turned to increasingly desperate measures to stem the tide of the American Navy. Though all sides had undertaken suicide missions by individual pilots in the war to some extent, the Japanese were the ones to employ this horrifying tactic regularly. In October 1944, the American and Allied navies began to face an enemy deadlier than any other encountered before. The premise behind a kamikaze attack was simple. Load an aircraft with as many bombs and explosives as possible, find a high-value target like an aircraft carrier, and keep going until you hit it. Though it might seem that kamikazes would have been easy to defeat, you would surely be mistaken. In conventional air attacks, if the flak is too heavy or too many enemy aircraft approaching, pilots concerned with preserving their lives would break off and return to base. This was not the case for kamikazes. What made these men so terrifying was not only the weapon they piloted at US ships at hundreds of miles an hour, but their training before even stepping into the cockpit. Though most of the early kamikazes were already experienced veterans, most of the ones that flew later on were raw recruits, receiving little flight training. These men instead went through intensive religious and ideological classes to further increase their conviction for the cause. That way, by the time they took off for that final time, they were more determined than ever to deliver their deadly payload. Even though the US did develop tactics such as increasing air patrols, building defense and depth with picket ships, and developing better time-delayed fuses, kamikaze attacks were still devastating. During their debut in the Pacific Theater, kamikazes obliterated an American task force, steaming for the Philippines, sinking seven ships, and damaging another 40. These attacks would continue with intensity through the Battle of Okinawa, which saw 36 ships sunk, 386 damaged, and almost 5,000 sailors killed, making it the deadliest battle of the war for the U.S. Navy. The Shu Mine 42 Mines are a great way to deter enemy movement or funnel them into areas where you can bring pre-planned fire on them. They're also an excellent delaying tactic since it forces an advancing enemy to slow down to carefully prod for these devices since, unlike most other mines, the Germans made these mines out of wood. As its name would imply, the Schumann mine was an anti-personnel mine that the German army first developed in 1942. Due to the increasing number of ways to detect and destroy mines, they wanted something that Allied troops could not detect. Additionally, due to the wartime shortages of metal, the Germans wanted to conserve as much as possible. With millions of these mines being produced, the cost savings proved significant for the German war machine. But where the mine really paid off was the fear brought into the hearts of Allied soldiers, hoping not to step on them. The shoe mine was not designed to be an extremely large or complex mine. It was composed of a simple wooden box with a detonator and some explosives. Its primary purpose was to maim soldiers, and the war diaries and official records of Allied troops can attest to their effectiveness. Due to their small size and inability to be detected with a metal detector, the only surefire way to identify these little buggers would be to probe the ground with a knife or bayonet manually. However, such methods proved impractical when the Germans placed them on roads or other areas that Allied troops had to cross under fire. Not wanting to be defeated, some Allied troops came up with ingenious methods to defeat them. The British, for example, came up with an idea of placing a garden roller with metal spikes on the end of it. A brave volunteer would kit up in an early version of a bomb suit and roll this contraption across the battlefield. Whenever it hit a mine, it would blow up and the soldier would keep moving on to the next one. Though this design was eventually not approved for broader use by General Montgomery, it's an excellent example of how such a simple device could defeat every advanced detection system the Allies possessed, causing fear and casualties in its wake. Despite lacking official bodies of research from contemporary accounts, troops noted that this mine, along with the vaunted MG-42 and screaming meanie Nebelwerfer guns, were chief among their least favorite things to encounter on the battlefield. U.S. Submarines German U-boats get a lot of credit for World War II, and rightfully so. They sunk almost 15 million tons worth of war material and sent tens of thousands of sailors down to an early, watery grave. However, even though U-boats are more famously known during the war, it was actually the U.S. submarine force that was much more feared, and for a good reason. Immediately following the attack on Pearl Harbor, the first units that struck back were U.S. submarines. President Roosevelt ordered that a campaign of unrestricted submarine warfare would be brought against the Japanese, and the service gladly obliged the order. Pretty soon, without warning, Japanese naval and merchant vessels were being sent to the bottom at an alarming rate. U.S. submarines were so successful at attacking Japanese shipping 
that by the end of 1944, most submarine commanders reported patrols were increasingly difficult, not due necessarily to enemy action, but due to a loss of targets to shoot. This sentiment can be seen in the data for Japanese merchant shipping losses, with over 8.5 million tons of shipping sunk. Those figures mean that the entire Japanese merchant marine was sunk almost twice over, compared to its starting tonnage at the beginning of the war. Not only did the Japanese Navy and merchant marines fear US submarines, but also their army. During the war, historians have estimated that over 44 Japanese troop ships were sunk, with over 33 of those causing over a thousand deaths. Some of the troop ships, such as the sinking of the Toyama Maru, resulted in the deaths of over 5,000 soldiers. In total, tens of thousands of Japanese troops were killed at sea, and the threat posed by submarines was so bad, top army commanders were unsure if they'd be able to reinforce their far-flung Pacific outposts. If sinking the entire Japanese merchant fleet, helping cripple the Japanese navy, and preventing the Japanese army from moving were not terrifying enough, another way that submarines caused even more suffering was through their blockade of Japan. Since so many merchant ships were sunk and so many had to delay their journeys days or weeks to get into Japan, the civilian population suffered immensely. Because Japan is an island nation, it relies solely on imports of raw materials, food, and fuel from abroad to keep it going. However, because of the constant attacks by US submarines, the Japanese war economy greatly suffered, and the blockade was the main cause for every type of shortage possible in Japan. US commanders would remark after the war that US submarines were the most critical weapon at disabling the Japanese economy and war effort. Sarin Gas While many people might be familiar with sarin gas from its use in modern-day war zones in the Middle East, the Germans actually invented it in 1938. During their research to design a better pesticide to kill weevils, German scientist Gerhard Schrader found it created a combination far too deadly for some afternoon gardening when he mixed phosphorus with cyanide. A loyal Nazi, Gerhard took his findings to the German military who quickly embraced the concoction. After rigorous testing, the military produced around 30,000 tons of the stuff. The sarin gas was then weaponized by putting it on specially designed artillery shells that could hurl the deadly gas at advancing Allied troops. Despite having it available since the beginning of the war, and against his general's urgings to use it, Hitler probably made the only correct decision in his life by not employing the weapon. Though conspiracy theories abound as to why Hitler never used it, especially as he knew the war was lost and had nothing to lose, the matter is probably more pragmatic than someone would think. Many people claim that due to his survival of a poison gas attack in the First World War, he was scarred for life and refused to use it on other people. As anyone with any knowledge of the Holocaust would know, he had no problems using deadly cyanide against millions of victims. Rather, it's likely he believed that doing so would result in a massive retaliation against his military, which, especially with the war going on the way it was, it probably was something he didn't want to risk. For the Allies, it was definitely good that he never chose to employ sarin gas in combat. Sarin gas is a terrible chemical weapon and kills by essentially blocking the nerves in your muscles from speaking with your brain. As a result, you begin to convulse and essentially suffocate to death since your muscles need more oxygen than your body will provide. Additionally, it was in the Allies' favor since when the American and British troops captured stockpiles of the weapon at the end of the war, they had no idea what it even was, much less being able to provide effective countermeasures against it. So even though it never was employed in action, this weapon definitely ranks among the most terrifying weapons of the war due to its potential to be used. Unit 731 Biological Attacks The human experiments and torturous murder of tens of thousands of prisoners are widely known and studied in this infamous weapons facility. Though Unit 731's main complex in northern China has garnered the most attention in Western literature, a little-known yet even more terrifying aspect of its methods includes an organized biological weapons campaign designed to defeat the Chinese people. With the war in China raging for over five years by 1941, the Japanese army was looking for ways to turn the tide of the war and crush stubborn Chinese resistance facing them. By this time, the Japanese army had already proved that they viewed Chinese soldiers and civilians as less than human and would resort to any means necessary to defeat them. When researchers with Unit 731 approached army officials with their plans to test a variety of diseases to see which ones were the most effective at causing a pandemic, they happily obliged. After choosing various diseases such as cholera, bubonic plague, typhoid, anthrax, botulism, and dysentery, Unit 731 decided to run live test trials of the effects of these deadly diseases by employing them against the civilian population. 
Throughout the course of 1941, no fewer than 11 Chinese cities were devastated by these diseases, as they killed tens of thousands and sickened hundreds of thousands more, either through dropping specially made porcelain bombs, crop dusting with aircraft, poisoning water supplies, or purposefully infecting food and clothing headed towards civilian population centers, the Japanese scientists proved their ability to bring biological destruction against their enemies. The army was more than pleased with the results of these tests, and soon ordered detachments of scientists and specially trained army personnel to be distributed throughout their forces in China to be used against the Chinese military as well. Though there were many such attacks throughout the war in China, perhaps one of the deadliest and most terrifying was the May 1942 biological attack on Baoshan. Situated near the border with Burma, this area of southeastern China was vital for the Japanese military to control in order to prevent resupply of Chinese forces in the region from the south. After the successful test trials of 1941, the army wanted to start conducting biological warfare operations in conjunction with its conventional military attacks. Between May 4 to May 6, 1942, the city was bombarded by tons of munitions from Japanese planes to include numerous bombs filled with disease-ridden flies. Additionally, troops from Unit 731 poisoned local water supplies with cholera. The Japanese hoped that after the successful assault on the city, the remaining civilians would flee to the countryside and infect their countrymen. To the surprise of the Japanese, it worked better than expected. Within weeks, a full-blown epidemic was ravaging southeastern China. Entire families were wiped out and villages were decimated. This area of China had never once had a recorded cholera outbreak, and this added to the suffering of those exposed who had no natural immunity to the disease. Because of this, by July, some estimates propose that over 200,000 people died. Even though data is scarce and death tolls from the attack range wildly, depending on defining the geographic location and time frame, this attack is still by far the deadliest single biological weapon attack of the war. While researching this video, we writers here at the Infographics Institute got kinda jealous. The big boss doesn't allow us to keep action figures, potted plants, or anything else in our pods, let alone have a cool office mascot. Also, the big boss stocks the bathroom with nearly see-through one-ply toilet paper. <clears throat> but that's a tale for another day. Corporal Wojtek was perhaps the coolest mascot one could wish for. Wojtek was a 6 foot tall, 500 or so pound brown bear that fought alongside Polish soldiers during World War II. In April of 1942, a group of Polish POWs newly released from a Siberian gulag were traveling by train throughout the Iranian mountains. They were headed to join the British allies in the Middle East during a stopover in Hamadan, Iran. Some soldiers shared food with a young Kurdish boy who had a large sack. The soldiers noticed that the sack was moving, and the child showed off his fine. He had a scrawny little Syrian brown bear cub. He found it abandoned and thought that his mother had been shot by hunters. The soldiers pulled together their meager resources so that Lieutenant Anatol Tarnowiecki could trade the boy for the bear cub. Reportedly, the bear was swapped for a chocolate bar, a Swiss army knife, a can of corned beef, and some other canned goods. Lieutenant Tarnowiecki kept the bear for a few months, eventually donating him to the soldiers of the 22nd Artillery Supply Company. The soldiers named the bear Wojtek, or Happy Warrior. They babied the cub, turning vodka bottles into impromptu baby bear bottles and feeding him condensed milk. As he grew, he was also fed fruit, marmalade, honey syrup, and beer as a treat. Wojtek quickly adapted to camp life. He wrestled with the soldiers, gathered around the campfire with them at night, and slept in their tents. The soldiers taught him to salute. He liked chasing down and eating the oranges the soldiers threw for grenade practice. Seeing how docile Wojtek was and the morale boost he brought to the soldiers, officers didn't mind having him around. He became the unofficial mascot of the company. Interacting with the bear was a pleasant distraction for the homesick soldiers, some of whom were barely more than boys. As Wojtek grew bigger and stronger, the soldiers would wrestle him two and three at a time. Sometimes they'd play tug-of-war. Wojtek also made friends with other animals in the camp, including a Dalmatian belonging to a British liaison officer. The bear and the dog would spend hours chasing and play fighting each other. The soldiers taught Wojtek to pick up men by their boots and dangle them upside down. It was a great way to haze unsuspecting rookies who thought they were going to get eaten by a bear. Wojtek copied much of the behavior he saw around him. He learned to stand on his hind legs and march along with the soldiers. He became skilled at drinking beer from a bottle. Also, he liked to eat lit cigarettes. He'd hold his mouth open for the cigarettes to be placed in, take a puff, and then swallow it. 
Some claim that he would only accept cigarettes if they were lit and turn up his nose at unlit ones. Sure, today we'd call this animal abuse, but the soldiers loved the bear, and it was a different time. Apparently Wojtek was a fan of coffee too. Along with the 22nd Company, Wojtek was stationed in Iraq, Syria, and then Palestine and eventually Egypt. The bear had a reputation for being mischievous and getting into all sorts of things. At an Allied Forces camp in Iraq, to the horror of some terrified women, Wojtek stole ladies' underwear off a clothesline. On Christmas Eve, after a traditional Polish feast where he and many of the other soldiers really enjoyed the wine, a drunken Wojtek broke into a camp storeroom. He trashed the room, spilling cooking oil and flour while looking for jam and other sweets. Wojtek also figured out how to get into the communal showers and turn on the taps. Unfortunately, he was really bad at rationing water, which was a precious commodity in the Middle East. Sometimes the shower-loving bear would cause water shortages. The army took to keeping the bathhouse door locked. Wojtek would hang around outside in hopes of getting in. One day in June of 1943, Wojtek noticed the bathhouse door had been left unlocked and ambled in. An Arab spy on a reconnaissance mission had hidden in the showers and was now face to face with the bear. The spy's screams of terror alerted the camp guards, who quickly took the man into custody. The spy was so afraid of Wojtek that he blabbed various secrets, including news of an impending raid, which the army then moved quickly to foil. As a result, Wojtek received sweetmeats, beer, and was allowed to take an extra long shower. In 1944, the Polish Corps shipped out from Alexandria, Egypt, heading to Naples, Italy, to fight alongside the British Eighth Army. Unfortunately, the British ship the soldiers were to travel on had rules against allowing mascot and pet animals aboard. The 22nd Company got around the regulations by enlisting Wojtek in the Army. He was given the rank of private and had his own paybook and serial number. During the brutal Battle of Monte Cassino, Wojtek watched soldiers carry 100-pound crates of 25-pound artillery shells from the supply trucks to the front line. The bear quickly began copying the soldiers, standing upright and carrying boxes that would usually require multiple men to move. However, sometimes Wojtek was lazy and carried empty crates. The Allies won the difficult battle and Wojtek's actions earned him a promotion to the rank of corporal. Also due to his popularity, a depiction of a bear carrying an artillery shell was adopted as the official emblem of the 22nd Company. The emblem was put on vehicles, flags, pins, and uniforms. Once World War II ended in 1945, the 22nd Company, including Wojtek, were stationed at Winifred Airfield on Sunwick Farm in Scotland. Wojtek became popular with the locals, especially with the children and the press. In 1947, the Polish army demobilized and most of the soldiers returned home to Poland. They were heartbroken to say goodbye to Wojtek. The bear was sent to the Edinburgh Zoo. At first, the zoo decided to introduce him to the other bears, but it didn't work. Wojtek thought he was a human. As a result, he was given his own exhibit. Sometimes, Wojtek's former comrades would come to visit him. They'd hop the fence to his area and wrestle or cuddle with him. They'd also bring him beer and throw him lit cigarettes. The zookeepers noticed that Wojtek perked up whenever he heard Polish being spoken. Wojtek lived out the rest of his days at the zoo, passing away in 1963 at the age of 22. Both Edinburgh and Krakow have monuments featuring sculptures of Wojtek. The Imperial War and Sikorsky Museums in London also have memorials. Sirens scream as British sailors run across the aircraft carrier deck. Japanese kamikaze planes are inbound. Anti-aircraft guns fire into the sky. Planes are launched from the deck. Sailors dive for cover. An enemy plane goes down, then another, and another. The sky is filled with explosions. But out of the smoke comes a horrible sight. One of the kamikaze pilots has made it through. The plane dives. The bombs on the underside of the aircraft reflect the gleam of sunlight. The kamikaze plane slams into the aircraft carrier's deck. There's a huge explosion. Fire streams across the runway. Sailors sprint with hoses to put out flames. When they're under control, the mechanics and engineers look over the ship. It's relatively unscathed. With a few quick repairs, the carrier is once again ready for battle. Nothing is going to stop the British Pacific Fleet, not even Japan's most deadly kamikaze pilots. As World War II progressed and Allied forces started gaining ground in Europe, a decision was made to turn their attention to the threat in the Pacific. The Japanese were invading parts of mainland Asia and wreaking havoc on the United United States' bases and fleets in the eastern part of the world. With Nazi Germany slowly falling apart and Allied forces closing in on all sides, it was clear that more resources needed to be deployed to the Pacific to aid in the battle against the Japanese. The British had lost ships to the Japanese earlier in the war. Less than three days after Japan entered World War II in December of 1941, they destroyed several British ships in the Pacific. The Japanese aircraft sank the Prince of Wales and Repulse, two of the most powerful Royal Navy vessels. After the loss of the British ships and many sailors' lives, 
lives, Japan attacked and captured naval bases in Hong Kong and Singapore, basically driving any British presence out of the Pacific Ocean indefinitely. The British were too focused on fighting in Europe at the time to send supplies and ships back to the Pacific. But in August of 1943, at the Quadrant Conference of Allied Leaders in Quebec, the Allies agreed that more resources and ships should be sent to the Pacific. The Allied forces still maintained a Germany-first principle, thereby cutting off the head of the Axis powers. But Japan was posing a real threat to an Allied victory to end the war. The Pacific was of strategic importance for Allied forces for multiple reasons, one of which was the oil-rich areas of Sumatra. Then, in September of 1944, at the Second Quebec Conference, a finalized plan to launch the British Navy back into the waters of the Pacific was formed. Britain offered to send a fleet of ships, including at least four aircraft carriers, to the Pacific waters by the end of 1944. The stipulation was that the United States welcomed the help, but the British forces needed to be self-sufficient, as the U.S. was already struggling to maintain their footholds and supply chains in the Pacific as it was. Admiral Sir Bruce Fraser was appointed the commander of the newly designated British Pacific Fleet, and ships were sent to the Japanese-controlled waters. The British Pacific Fleet set up its main base of operations in Australia. It took a long time for the men, materials, and ships to travel the 12,000 miles from Britain to Australia, but the support that the British Pacific Fleet would provide was vital to defeating the Japanese and ending World War II. The fleet was already planning to sustain itself, since most British ships, weapons, and planes differed from what the Americans were using. The differences in the British Pacific Fleet was actually one of the things that made it so successful. The United States was struggling to defend their ships and bases against the kamikaze pilots in the Japanese Air Force, and although kamikaze planes posed a threat to the British ships, the way the vessels were designed allowed them to stand up better to kamikaze attacks compared to their American counterparts. Specifically, aircraft carriers in the British Pacific Fleet had armored decks, which greatly reduced the damage caused by kamikaze impacts. It wasn't long after the fleet had docked in Australia and made final preparations that they were called into action by Admiral Nimitz. Their mission was to attack and destroy key Japanese-controlled oil refineries. This was an important objective, but more than anything else, Nimitz wanted to see what the new British Pacific Fleet was capable of. It did not disappoint. On January 24, 1945, the British Pacific Fleet attacked the refinery at Plagio. They destroyed it and moved on to the second target at Songi Gerong five days later. Using planes launched from aircraft carriers, the British Pacific Fleet was able to destroy both refineries with relative ease. This slowed the supply of oil being used to fuel the Japanese warships and aircraft. This first mission had not only dealt a blow to the Japanese Navy, but the rest of the Japanese war machine as well, including the ability to launch kamikaze attacks. It did not stop Japan entirely, but it was a start. Unfortunately, a delay between the two attacks allowed Japanese forces to organize a defense around the Siongi Gerong. On January 29th, enemy forces located the British Pacific Fleet and tried to stop them from destroying the second oil refinery. As the fleet approached their target, Japanese fighters took off from a nearby airbase. In response, combat air patrol fighters took off from the aircraft carriers in the British Pacific Fleet. They met the Japanese planes en route and destroyed all of them before they could cause any significant damage. Any kamikaze pilots that were planning to fly into the ships of the British Pacific Fleet were shot down before they could reach their target. However, 16 British planes were lost during the battle. The pilots gave their lives to protect the fleet so it could carry out its mission of destroying one of the major oil supplies fueling the Japanese forces. After the completion of their mission, the British Pacific Fleet returned to Sydney. Luckily, the maintenance carrier Unicorn had just arrived with replacement aircraft. The lost planes were replenished, and the fleet was ready for its next mission. The success of the British Pacific Fleet's first assignment caused Admiral Nimitz to insist that the fleet be used as a flexible reserve for vital missions occurring across the Pacific. The next mission was Operation Iceberg, also known as the Battle of Okinawa. The fleet was tasked with intercepting any aircraft, including kamikazes trying to reach Okinawa. To do this, the British Pacific Fleet launched attacks on airfields on the Sakishima Islands. On the day of the landing on Okinawa by Allied forces, the British Pacific Fleet was on guard to stop any Japanese planes trying to leave their sector. The Japanese launched a series of attacks on the ships patrolling the waters, but planes from the aircraft carriers intercepted them. Intense dogfighting occurred over the open ocean. Then, out of the thick of the battle came a kamikaze plane. It broke the line of defenses and crashed directly into the indefatigable. This was the first British aircraft carrier to be struck by a kamikaze plane. Kamikaze attacks normally had devastating consequences, but after only a few hours of repairs, the indefatigable was able to launch and land aircraft once again. This would not be the last time a vessel of the British Pacific Fleet was struck by a kamikaze. During the battles to maintain control over the waters and airspace around the British Pacific Fleet, every single one of the aircraft carriers would be hit by kamikazes, yet none of the impacts would cause critical damage. What made the British Pacific Fleet so resistant to kamikaze attacks? A lot of it had to do with the pilots and planes stationed on the aircraft carriers. They would take out 
out enemy planes before they could reach the fleet. The expert pilots maneuvered their planes into attack positions and put themselves between kamikaze pilots and the fleet. But kamikazes did get through, and they did strike the British ships. However, the British vessels had armored decks that helped them prevent damage by kamikaze attacks that would otherwise have incapacitated them. The reinforced decks allowed the aircraft carriers to sustain damage from kamikaze impacts and still remain in action. For example, the collision on the deck of the Indefatigable could have caused a massive hole in a non-armored ship deck. But instead, the Indefatigable deck only dented about three inches. There was a large fire, but the crew quickly got it under control and immediately started repairing the ship, so it would be combat ready in just a matter of hours. The amount of damage the British Pacific Fleet could sustain impressed the United States. About a week after the Indefatigable shrugged off the kamikaze attack, the US aircraft carrier called the Hancock was struck by a Japanese plane. The Hancock was so badly damaged it had to return to the United States for repairs. The United States had so much faith in the British Pacific Fleet and its armored aircraft carriers that they were sent to strike vitally important airfields on the island of Formosa. The thought was that since the British ships were holding up so well against Japanese forces and their kamikaze pilots that they would be less vulnerable to counterattacks. The operation to destroy Japanese targets on Formosa was a huge success. The British Pacific Fleet wiped out planes, airfields, and railways. After Formosa, the fleet resupplied and headed back to battle. The British Pacific Fleet engaged Japanese forces once again and this time ran into some trouble. A kamikaze made it through the fleet's defenses and slammed into an aircraft carrier called the Formidable. Just before the kamikaze hit, it released a 500-pound bomb on the deck. It was enough to put a two-foot hole in the flight deck of the carrier. However, later that day, the crew was able to plug the hole and resumed flights from the carrier. Once again, the British Pacific Fleet seemed to be resistant to Japan's most deadly tactics. Later in the mission, a group of four kamikazes made it through the fleet's defenses and struck the HMS Victorious. The first kamikaze smashed into the flight deck and knocked out the carrier's catapult. The second committed to a dive, but Captain Michael Denny quickly ordered evasive actions causing the plane to hit the aft deck and bounce off into the ocean. The third kamikaze was taken out by an anti-aircraft gun before it could reach the ship. The last kamikaze hit its target. The plane caused the most damage. When it crashed into the Formidable, it took out 18 aircraft that were parked on the aft deck, destroying them. Even with four kamikazes making it through to the Formidable, the ship sustained only minor damage, another testament to the kamikaze resistance of the British Pacific Fleet. During Operation Iceberg, the fleet spent 62 days at sea, launched planes 5,335 times to defend the Pacific Fleet fleet, dropped 1,000 tons of bombs, and shot 500,000 rounds of ammunition. The British Pacific Fleet destroyed 42 enemy aircraft in the air and more than 100 on the ground. This prevented Japanese planes and kamikaze missions from reaching the United States forces at Okinawa. The British Pacific Fleet had already accomplished so much and resisted numerous kamikaze attacks, but they were not done yet. The squadron was split up and the carriers were destined to be a vital part of Operation Olympic, which was the first phase of the invasion of Japan. The Special Task Force of the the British Pacific Fleet ships dropped hundreds of tons of bombs. The planes from the carriers flew 416 defensive missions to protect both the British and US forces. The ships had to sail through rough water and even typhoons, but continued their support of the Allied forces so they could take the mainland of Japan. The British Pacific Fleet destroyed countless enemy planes, ships, and bases up until the Japanese surrendered on September 2, 1945. Without the support of the British Pacific Fleet, the war in the Pacific may have lasted much longer. The British ships were especially effective at resisting kamikaze planes, one of Japan's most deadly tactics. It was due to the extra armor on the ship's decks and the expertise of the pilots that launched from the aircraft carriers of the British Pacific Fleet that allowed them to fend off the kamikaze attacks and complete their missions. Adolf Hitler, now the Führer of Germany, has promised to bring prosperity and happiness back to the German people. He's also about to unleash hell on the world. Years of bloody warfare that includes a plan to annihilate the Jews and other people he considers a plague on mankind. But our first day starts with some deception and comes before the outbreak of World War II. It involves the British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, going over to Germany and having a chat with Hitler in his apartment. By this time, Hitler has already annexed Austria and it's looking like he might have Czechoslovakia in his sights. The Brits and many other countries are wondering what this strange man with the funny mustache might do next. At the meeting, Hitler and Chamberlain signed the Anglo-German Naval Agreement, which states that the two countries will not go to war. Chamberlain then writes to his sister, In spite of the hardness and ruthlessness I thought I saw in his face, I got the impression that there was a man who could be relied upon when he had given his word. Chamberlain arrives in England a hero. He's seen standing on a balcony at Buckingham Palace with the King and Queen. He gets a standing ovation when he speaks at the House of Commons. To tens of thousands of people he announces that there will be peace for our time. Still, there are some people in the crowd that have read Hitler's book Mein Kampf, My Struggle in English. They know about his thoughts on what he perceives to be a Jewish conspiracy to take over the world. 
They understand that he has big plans for Germany. They've read things like this. All great cultures of the past perished only because the originally creative race died out from blood poisoning. Chamberlain, however, tells those closest to him that Mr. Hitler is not insane. He says he's an excitable kind of chap, but in reality he would barely stand out in a crowd. Hitler, he says, is not hell-bent on starting a major war. Day 1, September 1, 1939, just over one year later. At 2 a.m., the German Army's 1st Mounted Regiment hears the call of a bugle on the Polish border. Someone shouts, muzzle caps off, load! There are around 1.5 million German soldiers and 1.2 million Polish soldiers currently fighting on the Western Front. The Germans seep into Poland like an infestation. Within a short time, the horses of the Polish are crashing to the ground. An hour later, the Germans march on as riderless horses run through clouds of smoke. In town, civilians hear the sounds of planes dropping bombs from the sky. Sirens fill the air. Kids and their parents are running through the streets, still dressed in their pajamas. The German Luftwaffe shows no mercy, raining bullets down on unarmed people. The head of the British military mission in Poland, General Adrian Carlton, writes a letter. I'm seeing the very face of war change. It's glory shorn, no longer the soldiers setting forth into battle, but the women and children being buried under it. This is a war of machines. A new kind of war has begun. Day 3 Men in flat caps shout from newspaper stands all over Britain. Read all about it! Hitler invades Poland! On the front page of the Evening Standard, a headline in bold reads, I will give Poland a lesson, Hitler. Both Britain and France declare war on Germany. Americans on the other side of the world listen to their radios and think, thank God that's not us. There's no way they're going to fight another European war. Day 4 Nazi Party official Fritz Mühlebach writes in a letter, I regard Britain and France's interference as nothing but a formality. As soon as they realize the utter hopelessness of Polish resistance and the vast superiority of German arms, they will begin to see that we are always in the right and it's pointless to meddle. The British and French are hoping that by saying they're joining the war, they'll call Hitler's bluff. In any way, they're still thinking that the people of Germany will overthrow this mad dictator. Day 8 The residents of Warsaw listen to their radios as bombs fall. Chopin's military polonaise plays through the din of thousands of machine guns. 30,000 bombs will drop every day, and the German army will storm the city, eventually killing 18,000 civilians in Warsaw, and in just one day, taking 140,000 civilians as prisoners of war. Hitler has plans for them at his concentration camps, places, as you'll see, where the peak of human depravity will be on show. Day 17 The Polish are thinking that the French will be joining them today in the fight. It doesn't happen. What happens instead is Joseph Stalin's army crosses over the Polish border in a vicious attack of its own against the Eastern European nation. Stalin is intending to get some of the spoils of war, and for now at least, he has a pact with Hitler. Day 36 Hitler is in Warsaw, proudly walking through the ruins of a devastated city. Foreign correspondents line up to hear him speak. Hitler tells them, gentlemen, you see for yourselves what criminal folly it is to try and defend this city. He sends the world a stark warning saying, I only wish certain statesmen in other countries, who seem to want to turn all Europe into a second Warsaw, could have the opportunity to see, as you have, the real meaning of war. Hitler's message is clear. Get in our way and your cities will be turned to rubble. Do not test me. The German army is a beast and other countries know it. The US ambassador in London, Joseph Kennedy, asks, where on earth can the Allies fight the Germans and beat them? No one wants to hear such words, but he has a point. Day 104 Hitler is angry, stamping his feet on the ground, spit coming out of his mouth as he screams at his generals. He's embarrassed more than anything. He's had his first taste of defeat at the Battle of the River Plot, when his navy, Kriegsmarine, experienced a humiliating defeat against the superior British navy. Maybe the Germans aren't invincible after all. Day 252 Hitler has already had success in invading both Denmark and Norway. On this day, his troops invade Belgium, with Hitler feeling supremely confident that its blitzkrieg tactics will make easy work of the country. Over in the UK, a new man has become prime minister, a stubborn old goat with a taste for war and a romantic idea of empire. His name is Winston Churchill. Soon he will make one of his moving speeches on the radio, telling the Brits, arm yourselves and be ye men of valor and be in readiness for conflict. The problem is, in spite of Churchill's powerful words, the Germans have a much stronger military, and Hitler knows this only too well. Day 270 The Nazis now occupy Belgium. Hitler's troops again show no mercy as they shoot down unarmed Belgian civilians. One and a half million manage to flee the country, but many thousands are slaughtered. Houses are on fire as tanks destroy everything in sight. Day 279 A big day, Hitler delivers a message to his troops. Soldiers of the Western Front, Dunkirk has fallen. Soldiers, my confidence in you knows no bounds. You have not disappointed me. 
40,000 French and English troops are all that remains of the formerly great armies. Immeasurable quantities of material have been captured. The greatest battle in the history of the world has come to an end. He's now winning the Battle of France. He sent the British scurrying off back to England where, to be honest, they count their blessings. The evacuation was perilous, but it could have been much worse. The German military is a force of nature. Day 299 Hitler is celebrating again. Bodies of French citizens lay strewn across the countryside. Their face is no longer recognizable. With 4.2 million German army soldiers, 1 million Luftwaffe, 180,000 Kriegsmarine, and 100,000 Waffen-SS, the Nazi Party military, Hitler has taken France. The result is occupation and collaboration under Vichy France. 85,310 French military personnel have died defending France, and the British have also been considerably weakened, losing not just thousands of men, but hundreds of ships and close to a thousand aircraft. Let's just remember that Hitler has always had a soft spot for Britain. He once said the English nation will have to be considered the most valuable ally in the world. He believes that the only reason he's hated in the UK is because of an American and Jewish conspiracy. Still, now he knows he has to defeat this tiny nation. Day 314 Hitler is sitting in a quiet room at home, mulling over a speech that Churchill made a while back. Part of it went like this. We shall fight in France, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. Hitler now reflects on this, smiling wide. He looks down at his pet Alstation and says, They did fight us in France, didn't they? But they lost, didn't they, my little German dumpling? Churchill knows what's coming. He outlined this in another speech. Hitler knows he'll have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age. Most of the world doesn't give Britain a chance. Even if Hitler has to hold back on a land invasion, his airstrikes will get Britain down on its knees, begging to sign a peace treaty. Then he can take off conquering elsewhere, notably Stalin's Russia. Packed, schmacked. Day 339 Into the Battle of Britain, the RAF is a handful, that's for sure. German intelligence has supplied information that is incorrect, thinking the British are much weaker than they actually are. The British, on the other hand, think the Germans are much stronger than they are. Hundreds of German bombers fly over cities in England and many civilians are killed, but the British are resilient. Germany makes a strategic error, one of many during the Battle of Britain. They focus on bombing not airfields but concentrating on cities. This brings great relief to Churchill, who secretly thanks Hitler. The cities can take it, he thinks. He's right. Day 427 Brits are out in the streets celebrating. People all over the country laugh while singing this song. Hitler has only got one ball. Goring has two, but very small. Himmler is rather similar, but poor old Goebbels has no balls at all. Germany has made too many strategic mistakes, but what the Brits don't know is that Hitler's focus isn't on Britain now. He can save that for later. Now he wants to invade the Soviet Union. He has economic reasons for this, but ideological ones too. He might have a love-hate relationship with Britain, but for the Soviet Union he only feels hate. He despises communists, and anyway, the Soviet Union, he says, is full of Jews and Slavs. Germany and Britain have lost over 3,000 aircraft between them and over 4,000 personnel, not to mention the 43,000 British civilians that have perished under the German bombs in an eight-month battle. But as no one expects Britain to hold its own, the people of the world have now gained confidence. Over in the US, where many folks expected Britain to fall, people are saying the Battle of Britain will go down in history as a battle as important as Waterloo or Gettysburg. A battle might have been won, but the fight is just beginning. Day 661 It's 3.15 in Berlin and Hitler is inside his apartment at the Reich Chancellery on Wilhelmstrasse 77. Down at his side is the Alstation puppy he's just been given, Blondie. He strokes the back of Blondie's head and says, They won't know what's hit them, will they, my little dumpling? 3.8 million men, thousands and thousands of aircraft, tanks, artillery are coming to squash those Slavic fools. He pats the dog on the head, saying, Stalin's not so tough, is he, Dumpling? Let's see if he really is the Man of Steel. Stalin might not be so tough, but his people are. Millions of them will be slaughtered in the bloodiest fight the world has ever seen. They will starve, freeze, and over 300,000 will be killed by their own army for defecting or other such transgressions. Around 5 million Soviets will be taken prisoner, and many of them will be tortured and killed. But these are people as hard as the cold Russian soil in winter. They will prevail. Hitler doesn't know that when he's detailing to Blondie what he'll do to them, that night he lies awake mulling over every other detail of the invasion. Operation Barbarossa is about to start. Just after 3.15, close to the Bug River Bridge on the Russian-Germany border, a German soldier shouts over to the Russian side, Hey guys, can you come over here for a second? We have some important matters to discuss. As soon as the Russians walk over, all of them are machine-gunned down. 
In the mayhem, German sappers pull the charges to blow up the bridge. The German soldiers think it's kill or be enslaved by an inferior race of devils. What Hitler doesn't account for is just how resilient these people are. Six million of them were not long ago killed under Stalin's oppressive measures when he began a system of forced industrialization. They know what pain is. Hitler's hoping some of them won't want to fight or they might defect, and this is one reason why he thinks he'll be victorious. Stalin will dispatch millions of troops, young and old if need be, and they will walk into gunfire because if they don't, their own commanders will have them killed. Day 829 Japanese planes rain bombs down on the U.S. airbase at Pearl Harbor. The U.S. is caught unprepared. It's a total disaster, and one which Japan sees as a resounding success. That'll show the Americans what happens when you offer support to the Allies, and it should make them think twice about interfering with Japan's plans for Southeast Asia. Hitler finds out about the attack only after it happens, since Japan hasn't given him any warning. He's delighted, telling one of his commanders, We can't lose the war at all. We now have an ally which has never been conquered in 3,000 years. Still, he's never relinquished his objective that one day in the future he'll have to defeat what he calls the Yellow Race. He's quite content, thinking that Britain will now have his hands full of fighting Japan in its empire in the east, and the US will stay out of its way, since it'll have to deal with Japan. Hitler can now concentrate on Eastern European domination. Day 833 The US declares war on Germany and Italy after already declaring war on Japan. President Roosevelt matches Churchill with his rousing words, saying, The forces endeavoring to enslave the entire world now are moving toward this hemisphere. Rapid and united effort by all the peoples of the world who are determined to remain free will ensure a world victory of the forces of justice and a righteousness over the forces of savagery and barbarism. Hitler believes the US, a race of mongrels, can't fight to save their lives. He has little respect for this relatively new nation, but he'll see what these mongrels are capable of soon. Day 1010 If you need to know about the USA's strength, look no further than the victory against Japan in the Battle of Midway. It just happened on this day. Japan takes an absolute beating, but not quite a knockout punch. 3,057 Japanese have died compared to the USA's 307. Day 1100 A German soldier named Hans-Jürgen Hartmann says never mind how many Russians they slaughter, they just keep coming. He and his men are starving too and dying from the bitter cold. They've been ordered to kill everyone in sight. In his diary he writes, how brutal this war is becoming. It's now a total war, a war against women, children, and old people, and that is the greatest horror. But he, like the other troops, has had words like this drilled into his head time and again. Russia, a country of cruelty, must be cruelly treated. At some point soon Hitler will realize he can't outright win this war, and he'll carry on fighting in order to get what he thinks Germany deserves as part of settlements. Day 1206 The battles of Stalingrad and Leningrad have been raging for a while now, and they're both horrific affairs. Together millions of people will die, mostly Soviets, but Germany will also see a shocking number of casualties. War is always monstrous, but these battles are something the word monstrous cannot begin to describe. Both sides have acted with savagery on an unprecedented scale, but Stalin has taken advantage of this by getting his people into a state of fury in what he's called the Patriotic War. But as time passes, some German soldiers don't hold out much hope for a victory, as can be seen in the words of a panzer officer named Wolfgang Paul. He writes, We have blundered mistakenly into an alien landscape with which we can never be properly acquainted. Everything is cold, hostile, and working against us. Another German soldier says the Russians will fight to the very last man and die over every last foot of land. He says we're entering a war of attrition and I only hope in the long run that Germany will win it. Day 1250 in Leningrad, the people are being starved, with bread rations being only 4.5 ounces per day. The people try to carry on. A scientist named Axel Reichardt actually finishes a great work called The Fauna of the Soviet Union. Days later, he's found slumped over in a chair, dead. The theater still puts on plays, but half starved, the actors collapse on stage. A woman named Elena writes in her diary, People are so weak with hunger that they're completely indifferent to death. They perish as if they're falling asleep. Those half-dead people who are still around do not even pay attention to them. Perhaps the most shocking thing is cannibalism among the starved. In the winter of 1942, a report at the militia office in Leningrad contains these chilling words. One woman, utterly worn out and desperate, said that when her husband fainted through exhaustion and lack of food, she hacked off a part of his leg to feed herself and her children. That woman was executed. The British and the Americans don't know the full scale of the misery. They're just hoping the Russians can hold out, not concerned about how they do it. Lieutenant von Heil writes back to his family in Germany, Human life is cheap, cheaper than the shovels we use to clear the roads of snow. The state we've reached will seem quite unbelievable to you back home. We do not kill humans but the enemy, who are rendered impersonal animals at best. They behave the same toward us. 
These battles on the Eastern Front will go on for years and easily be the biggest bloodbath of World War II, but Russia will hold out. Day 1400 Hitler is reading documents about what's happening in the Nazi death camps. Around 6 million Jews will die at the hands of the Nazis, while prisoners of other ethnicities will be murdered, starved, or beaten to death, or used for medical experiments in the camps. The human depravity at these camps is incalculable. Things are changing on the battlefields, though, and Hitler is now rarely the receiver of good news. Day 1532 Hitler finds himself backed into a corner. The Italians have just retreated and he knows that the Soviets are about to stage a big offensive. He thinks if he can just push back the Anglo-American invasion of France, he might be able to move more troops back to Russia. Many of Hitler's top generals don't agree with his orders, with one of them, Rolf Helmut Schroeder, saying if he just lets them decide what to do, they might stand a chance at having some success. Still, Hitler's word is final. He's deluded, thinking his posters on the walls in Ukraine, saying Hitler the Liberator will become a reality. He's wrong. Day 1542 Hitler writes an important letter to his generals. He says no more troops should be sent to the Eastern Front. He says the Anglo-American armies must be fought in Italy and France, where they soon will be. At this point, the long battle of Leningrad is pretty much lost, but the Germans keep fighting. There's much debate among the US and the UK as to how to take France back, with Churchill disagreeing with the Americans about bombing the French railways. He says that will mean too many civilian casualties, to which the Americans say such collateral damage will have to happen if they are to be victorious. 70,000 French folks will be killed by those Allied bombers, since many French embraced the Vichy regime and fought against the Allies. Some generals aren't too bothered about spilling some French blood. Day 1574 Allies stormed the beaches of Hitler's so-called Atlantic Wall in Normandy in France. What we know as D-Day, the D just stands for day. As many will later say, it's like walking into the jaws of death. 156,000 Allied troops, mostly American, British, and Canadian, arrive on the beaches, some embracing battle and others scared out of their wits. A US private will later write, There were men crying with fear, men defecating themselves. I lay there with some others, too petrified to move. He was hit in the arm and thought it was a bullet, only to find out it was someone's hand that had been shot off. In the US, everyone's listening to the news on the radio, while in the UK, even the industrial strikes have been cancelled for the day, so people can listen to live reports and go and donate blood. One of the German soldiers writes a letter that morning. The whistling of shells and shattering explosions around us created the worst kind of music. Only a tiny, tiny handful of our company remains. By evening, the British have beaten back the German 21st Panzer Division, and the Americans have established positions up to three miles inland. 2,501 men die from the USA, 1,449 British, 391 Canadian, and 73 from other Allied countries also die in the invasion, as well as thousands more Germans and, as you know, even more French civilians. Day 1600 Hitler is on the brink of defeat. His troops are now withdrawing from all over the Western Front Line and facing utter catastrophe in Russia. In Germany, many towns and cities have been devastated by Allied bombs and the morale of the people is low. Hitler should surrender, but he will not. He might lose, but he's going to cause as much bloodshed as possible, even if that means conscripting children. Day 1784 It is madness to carry on, and this is why some Nazi generals on this day try to kill Hitler with a bomb. They fail. Hitler is injured. And while his trousers certainly take some damage, he will be shouting orders again soon. Now in a state of paranoia and shock, Hitler orders an investigation and many, many people who he even minutely believes are against him are arrested. 4,980 of them are executed. One of them screams out before the executioners pull the trigger. The whole world will vilify us now, but I am still totally convinced that we did the right thing. Hitler is the archenemy not only of Germany but of the world. Day 2029 the Allies have entered Germany, with the Soviet Red Army getting there first in the east. They will give no quarter to German civilians. Their troops have seen such horrors over the years. A woman who is now starving writes, we are afraid. From the west, the British and the Americans will invade and like the Soviets will march toward Berlin. The Soviet soldier writes in his diary, at first the fascists fought back fiercely, but they could not endure this hell. Everything is bound to finish soon. He's right, kind of. As this is happening, the Germans are busy exterminating people in their concentration camps trying to burn all the documents that show what horrors they committed. Many of the Nazi bigwigs and scientists who work in those camps are already making their getaways, and to everyone's astonishment, in the decades to come, some will be helped by American intelligence agencies if they prove useful to science or in the new fight against communist Russia. Day 2042 The Americans liberate the Ordruf concentration camp in Germany and cannot believe what they're seeing. They see stacks of dead bodies, people alive that have suffered cruelty on an unimaginable scale, and soon, when the other camps are liberated, the Allies will begin to understand the absolute evil of Nazi ideology. 
the Soviets have already seen similar horrors. When they liberated the largest camp at Auschwitz, they found stacks of shoes and bodies thrown into trenches. It's around this time that from his bunker in Berlin, Hitler learns that some of his orders haven't been followed. He suffers a nervous breakdown. Day 2044 Stalin wants to get to Berlin first. This isn't only a matter of pride, but also because he's aware that the US and Britain have almost perfected a nuclear bomb. When he gets to Berlin, he's going to make sure he gets his hands on German scientists. Day 2063 The Red Army's General Zukov and General Konev have their troops stationed around Berlin. They meet with resistance, but many of the German fighters are boys that are so young their helmets drop over their baby faces. When they're shot and injured, they give off high-pitched screams. One reason the Germans are fighting so stubbornly is that they know what will happen to them if the Red Army catches them. It will be death, but it might not be a fast one, especially for the women civilians. Day 2066 From his bunker, Hitler can hear gunfire and bombs. He wakes up, as usual, to the sound of his valet, Heinz Linga, shouting, On your marks! Hitler learns that Mussolini has been shot and his body paraded around, spat at and beaten, and hung up with meat hooks, something Hitler imagines will happen to him at the hands of the enemy. He returns to Linga and says, You must never allow my corpse to fall into the hands of the Russians. They would make a spectacle in Moscow out of my body and put it in waxworks. Linga agrees and then hands Hitler some flatulence pills, one of 28 medications he's on, and also some cocaine drops for an eye problem. To make matters even worse, the Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler has just tried to negotiate a surrender with the enemy. It's the end and Himmler knows it. Hitler knows it too. On this day, he gets married to his mistress Eva Braun. They celebrate with copious cups of champagne, but this will be a very short marriage. Day 2068 Hitler wakes up at about 11 am and calls for his secretary, Trottel Junga. They have tea together and Hitler asks, Have you had a nice little rest, child? She replies, Yes, I've slept a little. Hitler says, Come along, I want to dictate something. In his last will and testament, he says that Germany isn't to blame for all the years of misery and carnage, saying it was desired and provoked entirely by those international statesmen who were either of Jewish origin or worked in the Jewish interest. He adds, the responsibility of the outbreak of this war cannot rest on me, and instead he blames British politicians and the Jewish hierarchy. Four people signed the document, Goebbels, Bormann, Bergdorf, and Krebs, and soon, like Hitler, they're all dead. Before they die, Goebbels and Bormann take Hitler's body along with his wife's body and burn them in the garden of the Reich Chancellery. As they do this, Soviet guns can be heard close by. Soon, the Americans and British arrive in Berlin, but it is the French army who believe they're owed something by the Germans that do most of the looting and killing. Sometimes they arrive at houses only to find whole families sitting in chairs in the living room, all of them dead already. This is why a British officer named David Fraser writes, There is so much vile cruelty in the world for us to say that with any satisfaction that good has been victorious. At home in England, the philosopher and pacifist Bertrand Russell puts pen to paper. He agreed that Hitler had to be stopped, but he still writes, And all this madness, all this rage, all this flaming death of our civilization and our hopes has been brought about because a set of official gentlemen living luxurious lives, mostly stupid, and all without imagination or heart, have chosen that it should occur, rather than that any one of them should suffer some infinitesimally small rebuff to his country's pride. Ever wonder how crazy World War II was? Well, here's some World War II weapons so crazy you probably never heard of them before. Number 10. The Krumlauf Curved Barrel Rifle In war, you often have seconds to react to an enemy. You turn around the corner and you're met with a barrage of fire that can gun you down before you have time to pull the trigger. But what if there was a way to shoot without turning the corner? The German war machine thought it was possible when they created the Krumlauf, an attachment to the Sturmgewehr 44 rifle. Featuring a periscope viewing device and a curved barrel, the goal was to allow soldiers to see and shoot around corners when shielded. The idea was sound, but there were a lot of issues with the final product. The bent barrel attachments underwent enormous stress every time the gun was fired, as the barrel had to withstand the pressure of a speeding bullet as it curved. They would wear out after only 300 rounds, far from ideal for a tense firefight. Even worse, the bullets underwent pressure as well and could shatter, leading them to come out of the barrel in shrapnel, possibly injuring the shooter or their allies. The mirror of the periscope was also vulnerable to fogging. The designers tried to adapt the attachment with shields and vent holes, but ultimately, the Krumlauf was just… crummy. But it was better for the user than this next weapon. Number 9. The Kamikaze Bomb Kamikaze pilots were a key part of Japan's war strategy, using pilots who deliberately crashed their planes into enemy targets and sacrificed themselves. But they were only as strong as their planes, so the Japanese army decided to give them deadlier weapons. The Yokosuka MXY-7 Oka was the first plane designed for one-way trips, a rocker-piloted, human-guided flying bomb. 
that would be aimed at aircraft carriers. It was one of the fastest Japanese planes ever designed and delivered a much bigger punch than the standard kamikaze plane, but it sacrificed function for strength. Because the planes weren't intended to come back, they didn't have the range of other planes, and they needed to be brought near their target by bomber planes which could then be picked off by American forces before the MXY-7 could hit its target. When they did hit their target, they did serious damage, but rarely enough to sink major US vessels. They were mostly used in an attempt by the Allies to retake Okinawa, and their impact was minor. The Japanese tried to refine it to make it stronger and more effective, but time ran out and the war ended. The next item struck fear into the enemy, but that's about all it did. Number 8. The Gustav Rail Cannon The soldiers defending the French Maginot Line hear a massive rumble, and soon over the hill a monstrosity appears. It's a rail cannon almost impossibly large, 150 feet in length, with a barrel of 100 feet alone. It looks like a metal dinosaur, and it roars like one as well. It fires the heaviest artillery shells around, and its range can hit targets from far larger distances than other guns. This is the Schwer Gustav Railway gun, and its image struck terror into the hearts of the Allies. But the reality was far more complicated. Hitler liked big menacing weapons and was quickly won over by the Gustav's impressive design. The military command was less impressed. Yes, the Gustav delivered a powerful punch, but the effort needed to operate it was massive. It needed to be transported in parts and assembled and mounted on site, which took 4,000 soldiers. And it was so expensive to build that the Nazis deployed anti-aircraft units to defend them. It's not a surprise that only a few were ever created. The investment wasn't worth the result. But the Nazis had another weapon that was much smaller, but no less deadly. Number 7. Goliath Tracked Mine Landmines are one of the most feared weapons of war, being buried and waiting for an enemy soldier or tank to go over them and then blowing them to bits. But what if the mines weren't sitting ducks? What if they could come for the enemy? Research was ongoing since World War I as German engineers experimented with small tracked vehicles that could be remote controlled to deliver bombs. Early attempts failed, but later versions were equipped with high explosives of up to 220 pounds and could be sent to target tanks. But there were some major downsides to these new weapons. First, they were single-use devices, similar to kamikaze planes but without the living pilot. Second, remote control technology was still rudimentary and steering wasn't particularly accurate, meaning the best strategy was simply to aim them and hope for the best. Third, they were expensive to produce, and while over 7,500 were produced, they were too big and unwieldy to be effective weapons. They're an interesting artifact of the war, but armies found it much more effective to stick to traditional mines. Other attempts to replace landmines were much more controversial. Number 6. Mine Dogs One of the most vicious battlefronts of the war was Russia, where German tanks were invading after betraying their former ally. The Russians were suffering heavy casualties and were outgunned by the Nazis' superior firepower, so they turned to an unconventional method of anti-tank warfare. There was no shortage of dogs in Russia, and so the army tried to turn them into unique kamikaze weapons. They would hide food under German tanks, strap small explosives to the dog's back, and then send them to trigger their bombs under the tanks. Heck of a way to treat man's best friend. But it wasn't just animal lovers who found problems with the plan. Dogs are living beings, and that means they can be unpredictable. While the basics of the plan worked and even took out a few German tanks, it's impossible to ensure accuracy with animals. Some dogs simply ran off, and worse, some got spooked and ran back to their Russian handlers and detonated the explosives there. But the success rate was enough that the program continued through the war, with other countries training dogs too. Russia even had a program for training bomb-equipped dogs through 1996. It wasn't the only plan to use animals as bombs, but this next one had an unexpected ending. Number 5. Explosive Rats France had fallen, and Prime Minister Winston Churchill was desperate to prevent Great Britain from following suit. His weapons design team came up with a bizarre plan, turning rats into plastic explosives. Rats would be killed and skinned with their empty carcass then being filled with plastic explosives and shaped to resemble an actual rat before being sewn back up. They would then be placed near German boilers where they would be thrown for disposal, triggering a massive explosion that could devastate German factories. It didn't quite work out like that. The first shipment of explosive rats were sent out and quickly discovered by the Nazis. The British dropped the plans and didn't make any more rats, but the Germans didn't know that. They were shocked by the carefully hidden explosives and ordered an extensive search for dead rats at every military school and facility. They spent so much time examining dead rats that the British military authorities said the plan actually succeeded because they caused more trouble to the Germans than if the rats had actually exploded. But that wasn't the most bizarre plan to use animals as weapons. Number 4. Bird and Bat Bombs 
It was only a short time after Pearl Harbor, and a Pennsylvania dentist named Lytle S. Adams was outraged. He wanted revenge, and he wrote to FDR with a plan, train bats as bombs. But instead of calling the authorities, military officials looked at the plan and thought there might be something to it. Hibernating bats would be attached to timed explosive devices and dropped over Japan at dawn. The bats would settle in the upper levels of buildings and the devices would go off while they slept, turning Japanese cities into firestorms. While demonstrations were carried out, the plan never went into effect, maybe because some bats got away and blew up a general's car. But it wasn't the only flying bomb plan the military had, and the next had a major mind behind it. B.F. Skinner was a pioneer in the field of psychology, but he was also passionate about training pigeons. He believed they could be a weapon of war, even more so as messengers. He had trained them to pull levers and believed this system could be rigged to deliver a kamikaze bomb to its target. The pigeons would be trained to recognize a target and would peck to guide the missile toward it. A successful demonstration was pulled off, but like the Bat Project, as the war went on, the military shifted their focus to more traditional weaponry, and both pigeons and bats breathed a little safer. But in 1944, terror came from the skies in a different way. Number 3. Fugo Balloon Bomb Aside from Pearl Harbor, very few attacks during World War II hit the United States directly. But in 1944, a bizarre Japanese attack changed that. It was one of the lowest tech attacks imaginable. Paper balloons that would be guided not by any engine but by the Pacific Ocean's jet stream. But the payload they held would be anything but low tech. They carried incendiary bombs, designed to kill anyone nearby and create dangerous wildfires. They were actually the first weapons ever to have an intercontinental range. And when they landed, chaos ensued. Initially, the bombs caused little damage, but as they surfaced around the west coast of the United States, people panicked. Reports of balloons landing around the country spread, and the government created a press blackout to avoid widespread fear. That ended on May 5, 1945, when a bomb landed in southern Oregon and blew up, killing a woman and five children from a nearby church. An investigation revealed that the bomb had been sitting there untouched for weeks until the picnicking group disturbed it and set off the lethal explosion, the only World War II death on mainland soil. But not all World War II weapons were meant to be deadly. Number 2. Who? Me? Private Ernest Crocker came into the military as a trained chemist, and that gave him a unique position, designing poison gas for possible military use. But the military had another mission in mind for him. Remember those exploding stink bombs you used to play with as a kid? What if they could be mega-sized and create a scent so horrible it would send the enemy forces fleeing? Well, some might say this plan stinks, but the US government didn't think so, and funded the project that would be nicknamed the US military's Fart Bomb. But to develop this weapon, Private Crocker had some unpleasant times ahead. He needed to create a bomb that would deliver the worst smells imaginable, and that meant testing. He combined smells including vomit, urine, rotten eggs, human feces, and rancid dairy into a single package. And the workers at Maryland Research Laboratory who had to mass produce it were no doubt smelling it for years. The German army was ultimately spared its effects because the war ended before the stinky spray could be deployed. But this valuable work led Private Crocker to become a pioneer in the field of sensory science. But one weapon delivered in every way, but the one that mattered most. Number 1. The Great Panjandrum the final years of World War II saw a lot of experimentation in the British ranks as they created increasingly outlandish designs for weapons, most of which never saw the light of day. But one, the Panjandrum, would go down in history as one of the most bizarre weapons ever created. To the untrained eye, it didn't look like much, a big pair of interconnected wheels. But it was actually a highly sophisticated weapon, a massive rocket-propelled rolling cart designed to deliver an explosive payload to the Nazis. But reality doesn't live up to the hype sometimes. The Panjandrum would have been the fastest weapon of its size ever created, designed to penetrate 10-foot walls by traveling at 60 miles per hour right through them. The British superweapon became famous before it hit the battlefield, with citizens attending tests to witness their newest war machine in action. But it never quite lived up to its potential. Sometimes its rockets went off unexpectedly, sometimes it went in the wrong direction, a problem when you're dealing with a massive destructive rolling tank. It was never used in combat, but it maintained a fan base among military buffs. On the 65th anniversary of Normandy, a replica was designed and tested, and that too failed miserably. Alas, Great Panjandrum, you were maybe too spectacular for the real world. Everyone knows about World War II, but you don't know everything. Here are 50 insane facts about the largest war in human history. Number 50. The War Before the War In the 1930s, the world was still scarred by the brutal First World War, and few Western nations wanted any part of another future conflict. 
but they wouldn't have a choice because the future Axis powers were already brewing plans. Imperial Japan had been building its territory for a while, and its biggest move came in the Sino-Japanese War of 1937. This war between China and Japan went on until the end of World War II and raised many eyes around the world just about how ambitious Japan actually was. But it wasn't the only Axis power planning for wars. Number 49. PR Offensive Unlike Japan, Germany was in no state to think about another war in the 1930s. Not that it stopped them. The devastating economic fallout after their first loss in the First World War was used by the Nazis as a motivation. While Hitler was rolling out the PR offensive to the world with one hand, including hosting the Olympics, the Nazi leader was also arming up. The 1930s were a time of heavy investments in the military for the Nazis. So when they started their march against Europe, everyone was surprised by just how powerful they'd gotten. But the Nazis weren't originally called that. Number 48. Damn Nassos? By now, the term Nazi had become shorthand around the world for a force of pure evil. But when the party first started pitching their gospel of hate, they were simply called the National Socialist Parties. Nazis wasn't even their preferred nickname. They called themselves the Nassos. So where did the term Nazi come from? It was coined by journalist Conrad Haydn, who derived the nickname from a Bavarian word that was a synonym for stupid or simple-minded. Somehow, the Nazis didn't notice. But not everything about the Nazis was originally evil. Number 47. An Appropriated Symbol As the Nazis waved it around Europe and plastered it on their war machines, the swastika became a symbol of evil. Everyone was horrified, including those for whom it had a very different meaning. Although it was usually aligned differently, the swastika began as an ancient religious symbol that got its name from the Sanskrit word for a hooked cross. It typically meant fertility and good fortune, and was found in ancient civilizations around the world from Greece to India. Many of those who used it in religious rites have since called for its removal due to painful associations with the Nazi regime. And as war grew closer, some interesting experiments began. Number 46. Unleash the Death Ray! Robert Watson Watt was a British engineer who was a pioneer in radio technology, and when word got around of a Nazi death ray being built, people went to him. Was it really possible to build a machine that could down airplanes using radio waves? Watson Watt looked into it and determined the answer was no. But his research wasn't all for nothing. In the late 1930s, Watson Watt's research led to quantum leaps in radar technology, which made it easier for British troops to identify German planes and U-boats. But another technique to avoid war didn't go so well. Number 45. Pinky Promise? The governments of Europe were desperate to avoid war, so they made several concessions to Hitler. The most significant were territorial concessions out of Czechoslovakia, whose leadership was not even invited to the peace summit. Hitler promised to abide by the terms of the treaty up until the moment he didn't. The last straw was when he went ahead and invaded Poland, crossing the red line Britain had set. That was enough for Britain to declare war on September 3, 1939, starting World War II. But did Britain itself have a hand in it? Number 44. The Scapegoat For decades since, historians have debated the legacy of then Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain, whose name has become synonymous with surrender. His detractors say he gave away the store to Hitler for no benefit. His defenders say he was acting in good faith and everyone in Europe was taken aback by just how ruthless Hitler was. But the verdict then was swift. Chamberlain was ousted before the next general election by his party, and he was replaced as Prime Minister by Winston Churchill. But Hitler had been planning for war for a long time before that. Number 43. The Dark Pact Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin couldn't have been more different. One represented a fascist regime, and the other was the current leader of the communist revolutionaries who took over Russia. But they had one thing in common, a dislike for the democracies of Western Europe. In the months before Hitler's invasion of Poland, the two countries signed a non-aggression pact that detailed how they would divvy up Eastern Europe. But like most things with Hitler, it couldn't be trusted for long. But for the time being, the war wasn't much of a war. Number 42. Overwhelmed Poland fought hard at the start of the war, but they were fighting two much larger, better equipped nations that were determined to overrun them. In September and October of 1939 alone, as the invasion began, Poland saw its forces devastated. Not only were 70,000 soldiers killed and more than half a million taken captive, but the fight against the Russians on the other front was just as bad. The Poles lost 50,000 men on their eastern front, while the Russians lost less than 1,000. But surprisingly, not everyone was united in how to respond. Number 41. War or not? Britain declared war on Germany after the invasion of Poland, but the front was far away and the early moves of Britain were less than inspiring. The Royal Air Force mostly dropped propaganda leaflets over Germany in what would be known as the Phony War. 
Both in Britain and America, which was not involved in the war yet, there were many people who wanted no part of another war and advocated for isolationism. But it wasn't always wins for Germany and its allies right away. Number 40. Defeat in the North Russia was looking to expand its territory and it wasn't long before they launched an invasion into the neighboring country of Finland. This would have given Russia a beachhead in Scandinavia and a massive strategic advantage. But the Finns had another idea. Their well-trained army knew the snowy region and had some of the best snipers in the world. It wasn't long before the Soviets were on the run. This invasion also led to their expulsion from the League of Nations. However, Soviets' persistence would eventually lead Finland to signing a peace settlement. But the biggest front yet in World War II was about to launch. Number 39. Mon Dieu! Hitler's march across Europe concerned his neighbors, but many of them thought that he would eventually be satisfied. Then in 1940 came a line that no one could ignore – the invasion of France as Hitler crossed the Maginot Line. German forces advanced into France through Luxembourg and Belgium, overwhelming the French troops and leading to mass evacuations. It was the biggest German advance of the war yet, as the Nazi troops used armored vehicles and planes to gain territory in a hurry. It led to one of the biggest refugee crises in history. Number 38. Chaos at Dunkirk With the German troops advancing fast and many British soldiers stationed in the north of France, Allied command decided they had to evacuate and fast. There weren't enough boats and the army capabilities were limited, especially with the German troops having trapped troops on the mainland. The evacuation effort would eventually be known as the Miracle of Dunkirk, because over eight days, over 300,000 troops would be evacuated on a fleet of over 800 vessels, many of them civilian ships. But the crisis was only beginning. Number 37. The flood. France, Belgium, and the Netherlands were all invaded in 1940 and all fell quickly, which led to a massive influx of refugees fleeing Nazi tyranny. Over 8 million civilians fled their home countries, seeking new homes in allied or neutral nations, but many wound up in displaced person camps and struggled to survive. While conditions weren't easy and overcrowding was a problem in many places, especially with the countries on war footing, some refugees were eager to enlist and turn the tables on the Nazis. And as the Nazis marched across Europe, things on the home front weren't any better. Number 36. Holy War Hitler was a narcissist, and the Nazi dictator wanted to be praised everywhere. Something that raised his ire was the fact that the Roman Catholic schools in Germany didn't have his picture on the wall. Who was this Jesus guy that they kept everywhere instead? Hitler's persecution of Catholics intensified in Germany and eventually he turned his eye to the man in charge, Pope Pius XII, who in the latter days of the war had issued condemnations of Hitler. Hitler consulted with a general about occupying Vatican City and killing the Pope, but the general was so shocked he tipped off the Italians instead. There were few institutions the Germans weren't trying to destabilize. Number 35. Money, money, money. Hitler had an interest in weakening Britain's economy to make it harder for them to fight in the war. In 1939, he came up with a scheme to cause hyperinflation in his hated enemy with an unlikely weapon, counterfeit cash. He enlisted prisoners at a German concentration camp and put them to work creating countless fake bills of the British pound. A whopping $132 million worth in that day's money, over $6 billion today. When introduced into the British economy, it caused brief fluctuations but not the total chaos he hoped for. But not all of Hitler's schemes seemed to work out for him. Number 34. Shocking. Simply shocking. Hitler was obsessed with the purity of German culture and cracked down on any expression he deemed to degenerate. Books were burned in mass, and creators of art thought unpatriotic were arrested. Connoisseurs of the arts were displeased, so Hitler decided to shock everyone by holding an exhibition of banned art called Degenerate Art. A massive collection of over 650 books, paintings, and sculptures were put on display, and the public came in mass to stare, far more than the number of people who visited approved Nazi art galleries. It wasn't the only time Hitler embarrassed himself. Number 33. The Perfect Baby? Hitler was also fixated on the purity of the German race, plastering propaganda posters with images of blonde, blue-eyed children, which was ironic given that he was a dark-haired Austrian, but no one was going to tell him that. He even started a campaign in 1935 to find the perfect Aryan baby as a symbol of the country. His propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, was put in charge of the search, and oddly chose a brunette child whose photo was submitted to him by Hans Balen, a prominent photographer. Balen was an anti-Nazi activist who had submitted the photo of a Jewish child as a way to sabotage the Nazi campaign. It worked a little too well, as the girl's family had to flee to Latvia. Art had a powerful impact on those campaigning against the Nazis. Number 32. The Great Dictator 
Across the Atlantic Ocean, the thought of getting involved in World War II wasn't very popular. The United States had a strong isolationist bent, and many people campaigned against the intervention. The news media wasn't covering many of Hitler's atrocities, and those trying to raise attention didn't have much luck. But there was one exception, the legendary silent film star Charlie Chaplin. The anti-Nazi activist had no luck getting studios to fund his anti-Nazi satire, The Great Dictator, so he funded it himself at great cost. Hitler was reportedly not pleased to be portrayed as a buffoon. But a far bigger name was working the other side. Number 31. The Pilot While the America First movement had a troubled past, with many of its members coming from groups that were initially loyal to Nazi Germany, the isolationists found hope in a celebrity champion, Charles Lindbergh, the famous pilot who was one of the country's most famous German-Americans. Many people even tried to convince him to run against President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1940, with polls showing that he was the Republicans' best candidate. He eventually decided against a run. A celebrity with no political experience deciding to run for president? Crazy talk! The war was about to intensify and bring in new fronts. Number 30. Take to the Skies After the fall of France, Nazi Germany turned their attention toward Britain. A ground invasion would have been challenging against the fortified island nation, so Hitler focused on bombarding the British into surrender. But that turned out to be more difficult than expected thanks to the Doubting System. Crafted by RAF Commander-in-Chief Hugh Doubting, it set up a reporting system that let the British respond to air attacks faster. This would streamline the process of passing information between the ground and the air and foiled many Nazi attacks, but it couldn't foil all of them. Number 29. On the Run as the Blitz hit London and other English cities, everyone had a role to play to ensure their survival. Many of the men went off to war, while women were left to take on many of their old responsibilities. As for the children, many parents didn't want them anywhere near the city. One stray bomb could wipe out an entire family, so parents frequently sent their children to live in the countryside for the duration of the bombing, with relatives if they had them, or a willing host family if they could find them. This was famously the setup for the C.S. Lewis novel The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But Britain looked like a heavy underdog at first. Number 28. Outmatched Britain had never fought an extensive air war before, and its initial fleet wasn't the most impressive in the world. They had around 3,700 planes in the RAF to start, with less than half of them being high-speed fighter aircraft. By comparison, the Luftwaffe had almost 4,200 total aircraft, including over 1,000 fighter planes and almost 1,000 bombers. This allowed them to hit Great Britain more frequently, hoping to pound them into submission. The reality, though, was rather different. Number 27. The Victor While the island nation suffered heavy losses, including a single brutal day when they lost 39 aircraft and 14 pilots, Britain's defense systems were far more accurate than Germany's attacks. Ultimately, they survived the attack and persisted, while Germany suffered far heavier losses in the Battle of Britain. While the British lost over 1,500 aircraft and over 500 air crew, plus over 1,000 other casualties, the Axis forces lost hundreds more planes and suffered over 3,000 dead. And the war was about to change again. Number 26. New Fronts It was the middle of 1941, and the German bombing of Britain had failed to cause the nation's surrender. So naturally, the perfect thing for Hitler to do was open up a huge and brutal new front on the war. On June 22, 1941, German forces invaded the Soviet Union in what would be known as Operation Barbarossa. Why did Hitler decide to take this risk? What many consider to be the biggest blunder of the war. It was all about his obsession with race. Russia had a lot of land and Hitler thought it'd be great real estate to fill with German citizens instead of those supposedly inferior Russians. And it wasn't the only time Hitler picked a fight he didn't need to. Number 25. A Costly Declaration It was the most famous moment of the war, a day of infamy. The Japanese forces, looking to deter the United States from interfering in the conquests in the Pacific, had attacked Pearl Harbor and devastated the United States naval fleet. The U.S. immediately declared war on Japan in retaliation, and those advocating against war switched their strategy to urging the U.S. to stay out of the European front. But they wouldn't have that chance because almost immediately, Germany declared war on the United States in solidarity with its ally Japan. And just like that, Hitler had made himself another enemy that would arrive on the European battlefield. U.S. soldiers were on their way, but fighting wasn't the only way to die in such a conflict. Number 24. The First Casualty who was the first U.S. soldier to die in World War II? Surprisingly, it wasn't in combat. His name was Robert N. Losey, an Iowa native who worked as an aeronautical meteorologist. He was serving as a military attaché in 1940 during the Germany invasion of Norway. While working to evacuate American diplomats from the country, he was caught up in a bombing raid, becoming the first American soldier to die on the European front, over a year and a half before the bombing of Pearl Harbor. 
One unit of soldiers wore uniforms that would cause a double take. Number 23. Wrong uniform. The 45th Infantry Division was as American as they came, containing soldiers from Oklahoma, New Mexico, Colorado, and Arizona. Those areas all had a large Native American population, which influenced the unit's choice of uniform. They all wore a pin that contained a proud eagle, atop a swastika. The Nazi symbol was a commonly used symbol of good luck among Native American groups, and no one raised an eyebrow until the 1930s. But there wouldn't be any unfortunate cases of mistaken identity when the unit was deployed. By 1939, they'd replaced the symbol with the Native American Thunderbird. It wasn't the only pre-war symbol that changed. Number 22. Hitler Loves America? Being the dictator of an empire comes with some advantages, especially when you determine what's essential war spending. Hitler had secret fortresses and compounds built for himself, but he also traveled in style, on his own private train. It was basically a mobile compound with a conference room, a bedroom, and a dining room, and its initial name? America. Needless to say, that became awkward by the time the American forces were the ones targeting the train, and the name was eventually changed to Brandenburg in 1943. Some changes might seem less essential. Number 21. No hamburgers here. America's a melting pot, with multiple generations of immigrants influencing its culture and its language. And as the country went to war with Germany, people were surprised to realize just how many common words had German roots. Probably the most common example, the good old-fashioned hamburger, which got a name change to Liberty Steak in many locations. Of course, it was the same dish, which made it a little pointless. Freedom fries to go with your Liberty Steak? Food and drink could be oddly important to the war effort. Number 20. Gotta have my Coke. During the war, U.S. manufacturing operations focused on essentials. They made sure the troops had ammo, armor, supplies, and soda? The Coca-Cola Company's signature drink was beloved by troops, and the company showed its support for the boys in uniform by setting up manufacturing plants in North Africa. This allowed them to ship millions of bottles of Coke across the Mediterranean to the soldiers, and helped to improve the company's image and cemented the brand as a household name for years to come. But the tide of the battle was turning, and it was getting bloody. Number 19. The Worst Battle Hitler had made a critical misjudgment when he invaded Russia. Napoleon could have told him that you never invade Russia. But neither side was prepared for just how brutal that front would be. The German forces were superior and were able to inflict massive casualties on the Russians, with the country suffering a shocking 21 million casualties by the end of the war. But they were fighting on their own turf, had superior numbers, and inflicted massive pain on the Germans, with 80% of German casualties in the war coming from the Eastern Front. And as the war turned against him, Hitler became increasingly paranoid. Number 18. Death in the Ranks Hitler was surrounded by powerful people who advised him on the war effort, but he didn't like the advice he was hearing. It was very common for him to turn on people who questioned him and cast them out of the party. With even elite Nazi officials like Werner von Braun finding themselves on outs in the last days of the war, most famously he executed a shocking 84 of his generals over the course of the war, although most of them were actually plotting against him. And can you blame them? Most famously, Hitler was nearly killed by his own men. Number 17. Operation Valkyrie In the last year of the war, Hitler was becoming increasingly erratic, and many of his military inner circle believed that he was actively sabotaging the war effort. For one thing, he kept on killing his own scientists. Led by Klaus von Stauffenberg, a group of Nazi insiders planned to kill Hitler with a bomb plot at his secret compound. But a sudden change in seating arrangements led to the bomb only injuring Hitler, and most of the collaborators being executed. Even his renowned general Erwin Rommel was caught up in it, bringing a sudden end to his military career. Some of Hitler's plans were just genuinely bizarre. Number 16. Bugging England In the early days of the war, the Nazis were considering unconventional attacks on their enemy, and one tactic was smaller than usual, with more legs. The Nazis looked at weaponizing the Colorado potato beetle, a notorious pest of potato crops. They would drop a mass number of the bugs on British farmland, devastating their food supplies and starving the island nation into surrender. But the plan was ultimately dropped for one reason. It wasn't feasible to collect the 40 million bugs needed for the mission. But there were some lines even Hitler wouldn't cross. Number 15. Even evil has standards. The Nazi scientists were hard at work on deadly biological weapons, including enhanced versions of typhoid and cholera. However, when they presented them to the Nazi leader, he didn't approve and most of the projects never saw the light of day. What offended him about these plans? Hitler had no problems killing millions of civilians, but he was also a World War I veteran, and that war had a brutal biological and chemical warfare component. Maybe it hit a little too close to home. But far more powerful weapons were in development. Number 14. The Nazi A-Bomb 
It was one of the most persistent rumors after the war. Did the United States just barely beat the Nazis to the atom bomb? The answer is, not really. The Nazis weren't close to finishing a nuclear weapon, but that didn't mean that they didn't make progress on weapons of mass destruction. The Nazis had uranium and the Japanese could get closer to the US mainland, so the plan was to hit the west coast with a conventional bomb packed with uranium. But the plan never came to fruition and the German uranium may have eventually wound up in US hands. But across the ocean on the US mainland, development was heating up. Number 13. The Canadian Bomb? Canada was ahead of the US in the war in a lot of ways, entering the Allied powers while the US was still neutral. They even had their own atom bomb project with Britain called the Tuba Laos Project. It would eventually merge with the United States Manhattan Project to speed up development, with both sides promising to share their information. But the US didn't live up to its end of the deal and would be another seven years before Britain successfully developed their own bomb. And ultimately, the first bomb detonated wasn't in combat. Number 12. It's a go. The hope was that the nuclear bomb would lead to the end of the war by delivering a massive punch to the Axis powers. It took a lot of money and manpower to build the bomb, and the Allies wanted to be sure that it would work before dropping it. The first successful test actually took place on US soil at a testing range in a New Mexico desert. It was a massive success, and it horrified one of the men responsible for it, as Oppenheimer quoted a line from a Hindu sacred text, I have become death, destroyer of worlds. But there was a twist to the first two bombs dropped. Number 11. Alike, but different. The first two nuclear bombs detonated in combat, and the only ones so far were nicknamed Fat Man and Little Boy. But their size and designations weren't the only differences between the two bombs. They actually used entirely different mechanisms, with Little Boy being powered by the fission of uranium-235, while Fat Man, which was 40% more powerful, used plutonium. Now let's get to some truly shocking facts about the war. Number 10. The Good Hitler? William Patrick Stuart Houston was by all accounts a normal British lad growing up in Liverpool. He would eventually immigrate to the United States and serve in the US Navy, but he had a little secret. His father's name was Alloy Hitler Jr., Hitler's half-brother. Not only would he fight for the United States against his mad uncle's empire, but he would be awarded the Purple Heart after being wounded in combat. Just another noble German-American doing his part against the Axis powers. The Nazis used all sorts of unusual tactics to fund the war effort. Number 9. Who is Max Heiliger? The main purpose behind the Nazi persecution of the Jewish people was Hitler's obsession with race science, but the Nazis weren't above benefiting from it. They looted money, gold, and jewelry from the Jews they arrested and deported. But because many countries were freezing the Nazis out of their banking systems, the SS created a bank account under the name of Max Heiliger, which would allow them to transfer assets undetected. But in some ways, the threat of the Nazi death machine outlasted the Nazis. Number 8. Unholy Ground The Bergen-Belsen concentration camp was a brutal and deadly place where countless people died. It wasn't an extermination camp like some, but the rampant spread of disease and lack of medical care led to many casualties, including Anne Frank. When the camp was liberated in 1945, the plague typhus was so widespread that the Allies decided to burn the place to the ground to contain the spread. But amid the horror, there were heroes. Number 7. The Saviors most countries that were invaded by the Nazis quickly saw their Jewish community rounded up and deported or killed, but not Denmark. Denmark had quickly surrendered to the Nazis and allowed themselves to be occupied, and the lack of resistance meant the Nazis gave them more autonomy. That gave them several years before the Nazis began cracking down, and the Danes were able to smuggle the vast majority of their Jewish population to neutral Sweden. But sometimes, all it takes is one good man. Number 6. The Heroism of Sergeant Edmonds the Nazis were notorious for violating the laws governing prisoners of war, especially when it came to Jewish soldiers. When they captured American troops, they would demand the Jews among them be singled out so they could be taken to concentration camps or killed. But they hadn't met Master Sergeant Roderick Edmonds. When the army man was ordered to identify the Jews amongst the captured POWs, he boldly said that they were all Jews. While this put the entire unit at risk, the Nazis were scared off by the threat of being persecuted for war crimes. Edmonds may have saved as many as 300 people and was eventually honored as one of Israel's righteous among the nations. Some facts of the war are hard to believe. Number 5. The Old College Try If any Bostonians were fighting the Nazis and saw them on the march, they might get an odd sense of deja vu. Why does the Nazi Sieg Heil march song sound almost exactly like the Harvard fight song? That's because the composer actually attended Harvard University, and amid the Nazis' many crimes, a little plagiarism probably wasn't high on anyone's list. And for some, the war went on and on. Number 4. The Peace That Wasn't 
If the war hadn't ended when it did due to the collapse of Nazi Germany and the strikes on Japan, it's likely there would have been a new front as the Soviet Union invaded Japan. While this war never reached its scale that it could have, the two countries were still at war and still technically are. A formal peace treaty was never signed between the two of them, and negotiations fell apart in 2000 over some islands that Russia had seized. But even amid the carnage, there was some hope. Number 3. In the Blood While World War II was the most bloody war in human history, it did have a high number of soldiers who actually came home after surviving serious injuries. What set this war apart? It was the advance in medical technology in one technique in particular. Blood transfusions had been around for a long time, but they were consistently used in combat for the first time in this war, and it saved many lives. And in the fog of war, things got weird. Number 2. The Parachuting Nazi The year was 1941, and Germany was still confident about victory. So confident, in fact, that they sent one of their top men to the UK to negotiate Britain's surrender. Rudolf Hess, Hitler's deputy, parachuted into Scotland intending to return a hero, and instead was promptly arrested. He was kept as a prisoner of war for the rest of the war until he was sent to Nuremberg to answer for his crimes, where he received a life sentence. But the heroes of World War II included some surprising names. Number 1. The Big Guns Is this a list of soldiers or a marquee? World War II had a massive draft, and many of Hollywood's most famous names wound up strapping on their army greens. Among the people who would later become famous or took a break from the movies included Walter Matthau, Peter Fonda, David Niven, and Christopher Lee. One name surprisingly absent? All-American cowboy John Wayne, who was excused due to a football injury. For most of World War II, Italy was Adolf Hitler's ally. But then, seemingly overnight, the Italians betrayed him. They would pay dearly for such insolence. But why did Italy betray Hitler in the first place? You'd think it'd be on moral grounds for the atrocities he committed, but that's not the real reason. In fact, from entering the war to betraying the Nazis, Italy's World War II involvement was questionably bizarre. The entrance of Italy into World War II was a little shady for a couple reasons. The first was obviously that they sided with the Nazis, but the second had to do more with the timing. When Italy joined the war, it looked like Germany was going to win. Italy had been holding out for a bit and seemed to be hedging their bets. It wasn't until Mussolini and the other members of the Italian government thought that Hitler was going to win the war that they decided to throw their support behind him. When France fell, it seemed like joining the Germans in their conquest of Europe was a safe bet. Italian leaders hoped that by joining what looked like the winning side, they would be rewarded with land and the spoils of war. It seems that Italy was more interested in gaining power for itself than the morality of what was being fought over during World War II. However, that can be said about many of the countries involved in the conflict. If the beginning of World War II had been different and the Allies looked like they were going to win, Italy's decision of which side to join may have been very different. But that's not what happened, and in 1939 Italy signed the Pact of Steel with Germany making them part of the Axis powers. Four years later, on October 13, 1943, Italy would betray their former ally and switch sides to fight alongside the Allied forces to defeat Hitler. But how did they go from backing one of the world's most terrible genocidal maniacs to joining the Allies? There were several key factors, but surprisingly most had to do with the way Italy viewed itself. As soon as Italy entered World War II, they were in trouble. Benito Mussolini ruled the country as a dictator, which many people were in favor of at the time. What the Italians seemed to want more than anything else was a powerful Italy. Mussolini was the man who promised he could provide this, so much of the population went along with his fascist agenda. One of the many problems Mussolini had with running the country and fighting the war was that he cared more about loyalty than experience when it came to appointing generals and military leaders. This led to some dire consequences for Italy during World War II and was the first step in what would eventually lead to their betrayal of Hitler and the Axis powers. Once Italy joined the war, they immediately sent forces to invade Greece, the Balkans, and North Africa. The only problem was that the British already had a military presence in parts of these regions. The British would do whatever it took to defend the Suez Canal and protect their oil supply coming from the Persian Gulf. If they lost this vital resource, Britain would be in a real danger of falling to the Axis powers. A large Italian force of over 100,000 men entered North Africa and were greeted by an army of around 36,000 British soldiers. The odds were in Italy's favor, but due to a lack of adequate training and leadership, the British were able to push the Italian forces back. In fact, by the end of Italy's campaign in North Africa, the Allies had captured around 130,000 Italian soldiers. This was not only a huge defeat for Italy early on in the war, but completely embarrassing and demoralizing for the country. Things in North Africa were so bad that Hitler had to send his own forces into the region to help out Italy. 
With the loss of so many soldiers in such a short time, the Italian leadership outside of Mussolini and his inner circle began to question if they had chosen the right side. This dissent among Italian leadership would later lead to the betrayal of Hitler and the Nazis. And the embarrassment was not just felt in the military, but in every Italian who supported Mussolini and his decision to join Hitler. Many citizens supported the war effort to make their nation more powerful and to gain more land and resources for the country. But that would not happen if the military couldn't get their act together. Although Mussolini might have made the trains run on time, other parts of Italy's manufacturing infrastructure was far behind the rest of the world. The factories had a hard time getting the materials they needed, and when they did, Allied forces would bomb their buildings and set the Italian war machine back even further. Basically, Italy slowly realized it was in over its head. They were outmatched by most of the other players in the war, and although Hitler and his country were a force to be reckoned with, Germany was not able to send men and resources that Italy needed to get themselves back into the war after several defeats. Hitler's forces were now fighting the war on multiple fronts, and if the Axis powers were going to win, they needed Italy to start pulling their weight. There were also clear signs of unrest within the general populace of Italy just before the decision to betray Hitler was made. In 1943, only months before Italy would turn on their ally, a strike in the factories of Milan and Turin began. All the workers wanted were evacuation allowances for their families. The Italian people were starving, and hundreds of thousands of citizens were fleeing the cities and battle-stricken areas for the countryside. It was clear that Italian morale was incredibly low, and that many of the working class now wanted to get out of the war. Not everyone in Italy supported joining the Nazi forces in the first place, but the vast majority supported their dictator even if they didn't agree with what Hitler was doing. However, all that changed when it became clear Italy would not end up being the powerful nation its leaders had hoped for as a result of its allying the country with Germany. The citizens were demoralized and disgruntled, the military was in shambles, and Mussolini himself seemed to care less and less about the outcome of the war. It was at this point that the leaders of Italy realized a change was needed. It was time to get rid of Mussolini and to join the winning side. The Italians were now on the cusp of betraying the Nazis, and there was just one more thing that needed to be done. By the middle of 1943, the Italians had been beaten on and off the battlefield. The once proud nation was slowly falling apart. The Allies had already invaded southern Italy and controlled Sicily, and it was becoming clear that Hitler and the Nazis were not going to win the war after all. So the Italian government decided to jump ship and try to salvage what they could. Practically everyone, from members of the government to the average citizen, had lost faith in Mussolini and his ideologies. An emergency meeting was held on July 25, 1943, where Benito Mussolini was voted out of office by his very own Grand Council. The moment that he left the building to meet with King Vittorio Emmanuel, Mussolini was put under arrest. Surprisingly, Mussolini showed very little emotion and seemed to not care that he was being booted out of power. But there was still time to save Italy as a whole if the new leadership could figure out a way to betray Hitler and join the Allies without giving away too much of their own power. The Italian government made General Pietro Badoglio prime minister of the country. Badoglio had been Mussolini's chief of staff, but had very different ideas of which direction the country should take to regain some of its former power. Badoglio immediately began negotiations with General Eisenhower. He wanted to surrender to the Allies and help them win the war against Nazi Germany and Adolf Hitler. The deal was that Italy would surrender and allow Allied forces to move through the southern part of the country without any resistance. Then what remained of Italy's military would help the Allied forces push the Nazis north and out of their country. Hitler himself must have known there was trouble in Italy when Mussolini was deposed and arrested. The Nazi leader needed to move fast, but even he may have underestimated how quickly the Italians would betray him. In the wake of Italy's betrayal, Hitler did the only thing he could. He sent his own forces to invade the country. The Italian military was already so disorganized that Hitler had no problem securing strategic positions. He already had troops in the country that were helping his former ally to fend off enemy forces. To make sure the government who had betrayed him would not gain more power, Hitler sent his forces straight to Rome to capture the capital of the country. Nazi forces succeeded in their mission and forced the new government, including General Badoglio, to flee. But at this point, most of Italy had already betrayed him, and its citizens were more than willing to help the Allies defeat the Nazis. Whether Hitler was still friendly with Mussolini or not, he felt the former fascist dictator had some use left in him. Hitler found the mountain prison in which Mussolini was being held captive and sent forces to rescue him. Hitler then reinstated Mussolini as the new ruler of the Nazi-occupied northern Italy and named the territory the Italian Social Republic. Mussolini was once again the leader of a fascist government in Italy, but his reign wouldn't last long. As the Nazi forces were fighting off the Allies, which now included Italian help, the Italians in the north captured and executed Mussolini. 
This would be the second time Italy betrayed Hitler in a matter of months. To be fair, it was members of the Italian partisan resistance force who had carried out the execution, but as 1943 progressed, Italy betrayed Hitler over and over again. And keeping in character, Hitler started doing some insanely crazy things in Italy to show his displeasure. In the regions the Nazis controlled, Hitler rolled out vicious policies that forced Italian citizens to support and work for the Nazi troops that occupied their homeland. It seemed as if Hitler did not take the betrayal of his former ally well, as what he did next was absolutely nuts and a breach of the Geneva Convention. Hitler ordered one of his scientists to release a biological weapon on the populace of Italy. A Nazi scientist named Eric Martini was put in charge of the biological warfare project. Martini was a friend of Heinrich Himmler and a devout Nazi party member. At the time, Martini was one of Europe's leading epidemiologists, especially around the malaria virus. Hitler sent Martini to Italy where his task was to breed malaria-carrying mosquitoes and release them on the Italian population. The thought was that the Allied forces made their way further north, they would encounter the mosquitoes, contract malaria, and this would decimate their armies. Hitler didn't really care what the disease would do to regular Italian citizens as they had betrayed him and he was not a forgiving man. During Mussolini's dictatorship, a drainage project on the Pontine Marshes was carried out to create more usable land for Italian houses and farms. Everything went according to plan, and the swampland was turned into fertile farmland. However, Hitler had his forces reverse engineer the Pontine Marshes and make the swamplands once again. This provided the perfect breeding ground for Martini's malaria-carrying mosquitoes. Martini released over a million Anopheles labranchiae mosquito larvae into the swampland. Then, the Nazis added salt water, making it less habitable for plants and animals, but an environment that the mosquitoes could thrive in. This form of biological warfare had very little effect on the Allied forces, but was devastating to the local Italian population. Once again, Hitler's bloodthirsty insanity knew no bounds. Italy's betrayal of Hitler was complete when on October 13, 1943, General Badoglio moved on to the next phase of his agreement with Eisenhower. He provided troops and resources to help the Allies retake Rome. Surprisingly, as the war was coming to an end, Badoglio resigned his position of power. This took Italy away from the dictatorship government that had gotten them tied up with the Nazis in the first place and set the grounds for an Italian future that would be slightly more peaceful. The Italian betrayal of Hitler is a tricky thing because of the underlying reasons for the country joining the Nazis in the first place. However, due to numerous military failures, the demoralization of the Italian people and the turning of the tide of World War II, Italy decided to betray Germany. This helped the Allies defeat Hitler and the Nazis in the end. Would you buy products from a company that collaborated with the Nazis during World War II? What if that company paid reparations or started a foundation as a way to apologize for the mistakes of the past? Or what if the company refused to apologize or admit they did anything wrong? Would you still buy their products? We're about to look at several companies that had ties to the Nazi party or profited by selling products to the Nazis during World War II. All of these companies are still around today, and we can almost guarantee you own one or more of their products. Let's find out which ones. If you've ever taken a picture using old school film, you've probably bought a product from Kodak. For decades after World War II, Kodak kept a sinister secret from the public. They had been Nazi collaborators during the war. Kodak had subsidiaries in Germany and across Europe. Even as Germany's bold aspirations for world domination grew in the 1930s, Kodak kept healthy business relationships with the Nazi party. After all-out war broke out and the United States joined the Allies, the US government mandated that companies could no longer do business with Axis nations. This was a problem for many companies operating internationally, Kodak being one of them. Kodak allowed their German branch to become more self-sufficient and eventually the Nazis took control of it. However, Kodak took things one step further to make a profit. They began using their subsidiaries in neutral European countries, such as Switzerland, to continue doing business with Nazi Germany. The subsidiaries in Europe continued selling photographic equipment and electronics to the Nazis on behalf of Kodak. This meant that the Kodak Corporation was directly providing technology to the Nazis and making a profit off it, all while hiding these facts from the United States government. Government. The heads of the Kodak company justified these actions by citing the massive profits they were bringing in. Worst of all, the German branch of Kodak used over 250 slave laborers from concentration camps. After the war, Kodak reclaimed their German subsidiary and collected the large profits made by the slave laborers during the war. Kodak ended up paying $500,000 into a fund which provided reparations to families of people who worked as slaves under the Nazi-controlled subsidiary. But the company never actually apologized. 
Volkswagen is clearly a German word and it probably doesn't surprise you that the company had ties to the Nazi party. However, what might surprise you is that the company was actually started by the Nazis. Adolf Hitler himself laid out the precursor to what would become Volkswagen. The idea for the company started with Hitler wanting to create a car for the common man. A people's car. And this is how Volkswagen got its name. Volks meaning people and wagon meaning car. Hitler hired Ferdinand Porsche to develop the car. This initiative was where the classic Volkswagen Beetle got its shape. But the new head of the organization, which would eventually become Volkswagen, had bigger plans. Porsche insisted that the company also make military vehicles to support the Reich. The most influential of these vehicles was the Volkswagen Kubelwagen, which was a light military vehicle often seen in World War II movies carrying around SS and Nazi officers. It had a boxy body and a tire mounted on the hood. During the time period that the Nazi parties controlled Germany, more than 15,000 slaves from concentration camps were used to build the Volkswagen cars. The the company even helped build the Arbeitsdorf concentration camp near one of their main factories to ensure a steady supply of slave labor was available. In 1998, under pressure from human rights organizations, Volkswagen agreed to create a fund that would benefit the victims and their families that were used as slave labor. Other companies benefited from large profits gained by working with the Nazis in a different way. Several companies were started or acquired by wealthy individuals whose fortune started with the money made from dealing with the Nazi party. For example, the Ryman family, who owns JAB Holdings, profited greatly from Nazi abuses and slave labor. You might be unfamiliar with JAB Holdings, but you probably know the companies they own, such as Krispy Kreme, Panera Bread, and pret a manger These companies were all created post-World War II, however their financing was partly provided by JAB Holdings, which unfortunately means they profited indirectly from the atrocities of the Nazis. When this information was made public, the Ryman family said they were planning to donate around $11 million to suitable organizations. Coca-Cola is an American company. People around the world associate Coke with being American. When you think of the soda, an image of American families or friends enjoying an ice-cold beverage probably comes to mind. However, the Coca-Cola company had ties to the Nazi party during World War II. The drink line Fanta, which includes commercials of people happily dancing to upbeat music, was actually created for Nazi Germany. As the Nazis came to power in 1933, Coca-Cola was making enormous profits in Germany, selling their products under the leadership of Max Keith. He made the Coca-Cola brand more appealing to the German citizen, which resulted in a boost in sales. He also knew how to market the product in a way that would make people around the world want to buy Coca-Cola. During the 1936 Berlin Olympics, Max Keith made sure everyone in attendance had as much Coke as they could drink. As the Nazis prepared for war, they started to limit the amount of foreign goods coming into the country. This included Coca-Cola syrup, which began to hurt the company's profits. So the sneaky Coke executives used a third party to open a dialogue with Hermann Göring, Hitler's second-in-command. They convinced him to allow the import of their syrup. To boost sales even further, Keith began promoting the Coca-Cola company as pro-Nazi in Germany. His plan was to reach out to the Hitler Youth and win over the younger generation of Nazis. And this worked for a time, but as war broke out, restrictions on imports became stricter again. Max Keith had a new syrup created in Germany using local products. This new soda became Fanta, based off the German word fantasy, which means imagination. In 1941, when the United States joined the war, all official contact between the Coca-Cola company and Max Keith's German branch was cut off. Keith continued to sell his supply of actual Coca-Cola syrup to the Nazi party members and marketed the Fanta drink to the German public. The German people quickly fell in love with the drink, and Keith continued to make large profits for the Coca-Cola company. After the war ended, Coca-Cola took back control of their German branch. They even reinstated the recently convicted Nazi collaborator Max Keith as its leader. The profits made from the German branch during the years of the Nazi regime were funneled back into the main company. If you're into high-end fashion, then you might be surprised that one of the most successful fashion companies in the world has deep ties to the Nazi party. Hugo Boss set up a fashion label in Germany two years before the Nazi party came into power. Even before the Nazis gained control of the country, Hugo Boss was a Nazi collaborator. The company itself had produced early Nazi uniforms in their factories. In 1931, Hugo Boss made it clear where his allegiances lie when he officially joined the Nazi party. 
he became a sponsoring member of the Schutzstaffel and made monthly donations. Hugo Boss and his company created many uniforms for the Nazis and made large profits on outfitting their soldiers. The company also produced uniforms for the SS and Hitler Youth. In order to keep up with demand, Hugo Boss had been employing slave labor from the concentration camps. It was reported that the company used 140 slaves from the camps and 40 prisoners of war from France to make their products. The worst part was that many of these workers were either worked to death or later sent to Auschwitz or Buchenwald to be sentenced to death. After the war, Hugo Boss was tried and convicted for being a supporter and beneficiary of National Socialism, and his right to own a company was taken away. The company continued under Boss's son-in-law, Eugen Holy. In 1999, the company finally agreed to pay into a fund that was set up to compensate former slave laborers. If you've ever had a headache or needed relief from pain, you may have taken an aspirin Bayer. The company that makes the pain reliever may have one of the darkest histories when it comes to collaborating with the Nazi party. In the 1930s, Bayer was part of a company called IG Farben. It was a conglomerate made up of several chemical companies in Germany. As the Nazis swept through Czechoslovakia, IG Farben worked closely with the party to capture chemical factories to be used by the corporation. The chemists who worked for Bayer and were employed by IG Farben later went on to create Zyklon B the gas used in concentration camps to quickly kill large numbers of Jews and other people the Nazis labeled as undesirable. IG Farben also heavily used slave labor from the same camps they provided Zyklon B2. It was a very messed up relationship between the Nazis and IG Farben. They built a factory next to Auschwitz where they would use the prisoners their product would later kill for slave labor. As the war came to an end, IG Farben was forced to dissolve. The directors of the company were put on trial for war crimes. Unfortunately, justice was never served, and Fritz Tamir, who was the director of operations at the IG Farben facility at Auschwitz, became the president of Bayer after the war. In 1995, Bayer apologized for their role in the Holocaust. If you're watching this video, you most likely are using a device that has components built by IBM. The company, International Business Machines, has been around since 1911. In 1933, the president of the company, Thomas Watson, traveled to Germany to oversee an IBM factory being built there. At this time, IBM was using a subsidiary called the Almag to do their work in Germany. IBM's subsidiary had been hired by the Nazi party to carry out a nationwide census. The census itself was designed to identify populations of ethnic groups that the Nazis found impure or undesirable. This included populations of Jews, gypsies, and any ethnic group that would dilute the Aryan bloodlines of the country. IBM supplied the Nazis with punch cards and a sorting system that would make it easy for them to identify, locate, and track any people that they'd later sentenced to death. These same machines and cards were later converted and used to coordinate the trains bringing people to the death camps across Nazi-controlled territories. IBM's come a long way since punch cards, but at the time the technology was bringing in massive amounts of money for the company. IBM continued to conduct business with the Germans even after the US joined the war. High-ranking members of IBM falsified data from their European subsidiaries to make sure they could smuggle in punch card materials and devices that were in high demand by the Nazis. For IBM at the time, the Nazi business of killing was highly lucrative. During World War II, Nazi Germany was IBM's largest territory after the United States. Now many computers and electronic devices use parts created by IBM. The crazy part is that up to this day, IBM has not apologized for their complicity in the Holocaust. A company's main purpose is to make money, but at what cost? It's important to never forget the past so we don't repeat the same mistakes. Collaborating with the Nazi party and being complicit in the atrocities they carried out during World War II is a steep price to pay to make a profit. World War II is raging. Countless troops are in combat areas across Europe, while countries are turned into flaming battlefields. And you're in a resort town, sipping a cocktail on a beach, not a soldier in sight. How did some countries manage to stay neutral amid the biggest war in human history? More than 80% of the world's countries chose a side during World War II, with the vast majority siding with the Allies against the Axis, especially after the attack on Pearl Harbor got most of the Americas into the war. But some stayed stubbornly neutral, refusing to get involved and often making themselves a safe zone amid the chaos. While it worked out for some of them, others found that neutrality only lasted as long as the powerhouses said it did. That was the case for the Baltic states of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Estonia and Latvia bordered Russia, while Lithuania bordered Nazi-occupied Poland. 
and they all figured that their position between the powers was secure thanks to the German-Russian peace deal that Hitler and Stalin signed. They passed neutrality laws in 1938 as tensions were ramping up in the region and hoped to keep peace in their oceanfront countries no matter how big the war got. The problem was they were prime real estate, and it wasn't long before they found out that neutrality doesn't mean you won't get invaded. The first invasion was technically not a part of World War II, as the Soviet Union continued its annexation spree and declared all three countries part of their territory. They were compelled to allow Soviet military bases on their soil, but the Soviets were largely content to let the Baltic states follow the model of the Finnish Democratic Republic. It wasn't long before the news started to tighten. The Soviets accused the Baltic states of collaboration with enemy powers, and the demand soon increased. The smaller countries largely conceded to the demands, and the autonomy they had was soon gone but trying to stay out of World War II was about to take another turn. In 1941, Hitler made the infamous decision to invade the Soviet Union, which many historians believe was a key factor in his downfall. But the easiest way into Russia proper was to invade the Baltic states, and the Nazis soon put all three under military occupation. By this point, the Soviets were brutally repressing the population of the Baltic states, deporting those they designated as enemies, and many Baltic residents even viewed the German army as liberators. It didn't quite work out that way, as the Nazis soon began targeting the Jewish residents and anti-Nazi elements within the country brutally. So why didn't the Baltic states declare war on either party? The three countries suffered brutally under the Soviet and Nazi occupations, and the Soviet the Soviet army would later take back control in the last days of the war and firmly incorporate the states into the Soviet Union. While there were many deportations and executions, forced conscriptions, and major food shortages, none of the countries were directly targeted as enemies by the occupying armies. With no manpower to fight back against the two powerhouse nations, staying neutral was a way to minimize the damage of occupation and hope to survive the war. But it wasn't only the Axis powers and the Soviets that invaded neutral countries. Iceland had a lot of advantages when it came to World War II. For one thing, it wasn't on the European mainland. In fact, it was the most far-flung country in Europe. It wasn't rich in natural resources that would invite an invasion, and it wasn't a useful platform to attack another country. It also wasn't technically an independent nation, being a sovereign kingdom under Denmark. While Germany quickly invaded Denmark and occupied it, the Kingdom of Iceland declared itself neutral. They cut military spending, reached out to the also neutral United States at the time, and kept open trade with both sides. But as the war ramped up, some powers didn't like that. What little goods were produced in Iceland were still sold to Germany despite the naval blockade against Nazi powers. Great Britain wanted to starve out the Nazis and reached out to Iceland to get them to stop, but Iceland refused. Seeing Iceland's continued diplomatic relations with Germany worried the British, and they eventually made the unilateral decision to invade Iceland and place it under Allied occupation. The island nation's small military force made them easy to conquer with a team of 746 Royal Marines. So how didn't this trigger a war for Iceland? Simple, the Allies didn't quite treat it like an invasion. From the start, the UK and later the United States claimed that they were occupying the island to ensure the Germans didn't take control of its important shipping lanes. Iceland didn't resist the occupation, but maintained its neutrality and avoided conflict with either party. While no combat took place directly on the island, the water surrounding the island became more and more dangerous. Many Icelandic fishermen lost their lives due to drifting mines in the surrounding waters. The occupation was lifted at the end of the war, but the experience was a key part in Iceland deciding to declare itself an independent Republic in 1944, but some countries managed to make the most of their neutrality. The Nordic nations, the most northern mainland nations in Europe, had planned to stay neutral in any new world war that lasted as long as it took for Finland to get invaded by the Soviet Union. Sweden, wanting to avoid the same fate, changed its designation to non-belligerent, who could get involved with either party of the war but not to be involved in the combat. This allowed its air force to defend certain areas of Finland and maintain regular diplomatic relations with members of both parties. This would not only protect Sweden, but it would turn out to be a lifesaver for many. Sweden had only a small military following World War I and had no chance of resisting a German invasion. Thus, Sweden allowed Germany free passage for its troops through its territory at certain points and also provided them with a vital supply of iron ore. Sweden's status as non-belligerent kept them out of combat, but that was only going to last as long as they were useful to the Nazi powers. Over the course of the war, the Swedish armed forces were slowly building up, and by 1943 they were ready. They cut off their deals with Germany, Hitler was enraged, as he usually was, and considered invading. But Sweden turned out to be one of the Allies' secret weapons. While Swedish forces never went to war against either side, they had been secretly helping the Allies in many ways. They tried to warn the Soviets of the coming German invasion.
invasion but were ignored, and in 1943 when Germany began plans to deport and kill Denmark's Jewish population, Sweden's position as a neutral power was critical. The Danes were able to quietly ship their Jewish population to Sweden, where Germany couldn't get to them. As the war began drawing to a close, Sweden was prepared to aid the Allies in an invasion of liberation in Norway and Denmark, but the war came to a close before they had to change their neutral status. But some countries used the neutral label in very different ways. Switzerland had one of the longest streaks of neutrality of any country in the world, mostly due to two reasons. For one, the small country is located near the Alps, making it very hard to invade. Second, it maintains a large standing army through conscription, having one of the largest armies in the world per capita. Any attempt by the Nazis to occupy and conquer Switzerland would take much more effort than the small nation was worth strategically, so various armies decided it would be much easier to just go around it. But it also had value to the different powers in different ways. Switzerland was important strategically because it was a massive banking hub, holding money and assets from around the world. If the Nazis invaded, they could plunder the world's riches, which would permanently damage Switzerland's reputation as a haven for wealth. This would later be the source of much controversy over Switzerland's role in the war. They didn't look too hard at who wanted to invest in them and continued economic cooperation with the Third Reich for the duration of the war. But Germany didn't just need Switzerland, Switzerland needed Germany, as the Nazis provided much of the coal Switzerland needed to keep running. Even so, Switzerland was determined to stay neutral by any means necessary. Neither power was happy about this small European state firmly maintaining its neutrality and aiding their enemy. Both the Allied and Axis powers imposed trade blockades on Switzerland, but Switzerland stayed firm. They never invaded another country, but that didn't mean they didn't engage in fighting. Their troops stood at the watch on their border, and strength and skills of the Swiss army deterred Hitler from invading. But both the Allies and the Germans would frequently violate Swiss airspace, seeking shortcuts, and the Swiss would respond. It was common for the Swiss to shoot down planes that entered their airspace, until the government decided to intercept the land and capture them instead. Switzerland's neutrality also made it an inviting target for other reasons. For the many people displaced by the Nazis, they sought a new country to take them in. The problem, especially for Jews fleeing persecution, was that the Nazis would often follow them to their new home. This is what happened to Anne Frank when her family's refuge of the Netherlands was invaded. But in Switzerland, there was little chance of an invasion. Jewish refugees flooded to Switzerland, but Switzerland was notoriously stingy with granting amnesty, and many other refugees either found themselves interned in displaced person camps, deported, or faced harsh restrictions that kept them from settling in the country. While Switzerland maintained its neutrality successfully through the war, historians have since criticized many of their tactics. But for many of the countries in World War II, they hoped that they were too small to be noticed. Europe has five microstates, tiny nations smaller than many cities around the world. Today, they're elite vacation destinations. But during the war, they were more like ants amid a pair of battling elephants. So how did they survive? By staying out of it, as best they could. The largest of them, Andorra, was located right between occupied Vichy France and Francisco Franco's fascist Spain. Spain was not a part of the war, but Andorra was not connected to any Allied power and had little chance to resist. To avoid invasion, its general council largely took on a policy of passive cooperation. They didn't make it easy to enter the microstate and expelled those refugees who made it in. The country also became a valuable smuggling route from France to Spain, but still managed to avoid invasion. However, inside the country, a small anti-fascist sentiment emerged. Secret resistance networks cropped up to aid refugees of the Nazi regime and allied military members seeking an escape from enemy territory. This next country probably hoped it was mistaken as parts of Switzerland. Liechtenstein isn't just the longest country name in all of Europe, it's also one of the smallest countries. The mountainous region borders Austria and Switzerland, and is a wealthy country with a strong banking sector. Like Switzerland, it hoped to stay out of the combat entirely, and was mostly successful. It formed an informal alliance with Switzerland, brought many of the royal family's treasures home for safekeeping, and was largely too small and not strategically useful enough to be invaded. Ironically, its trouble came mostly after the war. Liechtenstein had a small Nazi movement and struggled to put it down. In the aftermath, Czechoslovakia and Poland moved to seize what they determined were German holdings in Liechtenstein including a significant chunk of farmland and forest. In the aftermath, Liechtenstein survived the war and managed to keep its position as a wealthy European haven. But the coming Cold War would bring more tensions to its borders. Some places, the party never stops. But did that continue during World War II? Monaco is a passport to luxury in the modern day, with its central city of Monte Carlo known as one of the wealthiest places in the world. Known for its gambling scene, the constitutional monarchy is located in the south of France. And during World War II, that left it surrounded on three sides by Nazi occupation. Monaco had only a small military delegation and no way to resist an invasion, so it wasn't a big surprise when they were invaded. 
first came Italy, which imposed a fascist regime under Mussolini. When the dictator fell out with the Axis powers and was later overthrown, the Germans marched in, and many prominent Jewish figures within Monaco's rich art scene found themselves targeted, deported, or killed. While Monaco had no large army to defend itself with, an underground resistance cell did form, and the country returned to democracy after being liberated. But in Italy, not one but two stands for neutrality were being fought. San Marino is one of the smallest countries in the world, a microstate only 24 square miles surrounded by Italy. And as Italy turned fascist under Benito Mussolini and joined the Axis powers, their attention turned to the strange sovereign enclave within their borders. San Marino intended to stay neutral, but this was nearly ruined when the New York Times falsely reported that they had declared war on Great Britain. A hurried telegram to the British fended off any conflict, but the San Marino government at the time did largely align with Mussolini. After the governments in both countries collapsed in 1943, the new San Marino government sought to stay neutral. Things went downhill from there, as the Royal Air Force mistakenly bombed the country, and it was later turned into a flashpoint when Allied and Axis forces did battle there in 1944. The state would also become a haven for refugees, and their troubled experience during the war proved that it's hard to stay neutral when you're in the middle of another country. But would anyone dare to declare war on the Pope? The smallest country in the world, Vatican City, is more of an enclave for the Roman Catholic religion and its leader, the Pope. In World War II, Vatican City was firmly neutral under the leadership of Pope Pius XII. Located within the city of Rome, the Vatican faced a difficult balancing act to avoid invasion by the Axis powers while also not compromising their faith. From before the war broke out, the Vatican was trying to mediate peace. It didn't go so well. During the war, Pius XII consistently condemned Nazi aggression and persecution, with prominent Roman Catholic figures in Germany and Nazi-occupied territories being targeted by Hitler. Hitler was enraged by the Pope's comments and briefly considered targeting him, but was talked out of it. Today, historians debate about Pius XII's role in the Holocaust. Were his strong public condemnations and covert humanitarian aid enough, or did he fail to live up to his responsibilities to the refugees? If the Pope's goal was to protect the Catholic haven, he succeeded. While Rome was invaded by the Nazis in 1943, Vatican City remained untouched. And halfway around the world, other countries were struggling to stay out of the fray. The nation of Tibet had enough to worry about as war broke out around the world. The mountainous region's independence was disputed internationally as it was claimed by China. The Dalai Lama, its Buddhist ruler, wanted to keep the country out of the fray, and it had no interest in getting involved in the conflict between China and Japan. However, as the battle ramped up and World War II swept around the world, Tibet hosted agents from the Allies several times. British and American military officers visited the Himalayan nation, but Tibet didn't have any reason to officially join the fray. They were more concerned with internal affairs and the growing civil war in China. As the war ended, tensions between the nationalists led by Chiang Kai-shek and the communists led by Mao Zedong reached a boiling point. The communists were left as the victors. Tibet had successfully stayed out of the war, but it wouldn't help them maintain their independence. They were annexed by China in 1951. But how did one of the world's most war-torn countries manage to stay out of the war? Afghanistan became known as the graveyard of empires, as mighty superpowers have been humbled on its desert battlefields. Why is it so difficult to conquer? A combination of rough terrain, locals who know it well and are experts at guerrilla warfare, and complex political and ethnic divisions that make it hard to install a stable government. But all these factors may have actually worked in the country's favor in World War II. Afghanistan was an independent nation at the time and a member of the League of Nations. Under King Mohammad Zahir Shah, the country chose not to align with either side of the conflict. While it did originally have diplomatic relations with Nazi Germany, it chose to sever them in 1941 to make it clear to the Allies that it was not aligned with them, and to avoid a potential invasion. Ultimately, Afghanistan was not of interest to either side to risk an invasion, but the end of the war would only mean more turmoil for the country in the future. And one country might have been a cautionary tale for Afghanistan. In the 1930s, Iran was quickly modernizing under Reza Shah. The Shah wanted to maintain a neutral stance in conflicts and relied heavily on foreign funds to finance his infrastructure projects. Iran had one major resource oil. And when the black gold is involved, trouble follows. Iran was able to stay out of the war until shortly after Operation Barbarossa, as the Soviets were invaded by Nazi Germany. They soon aligned with the Allied powers and all parties worried about the Iran-USSR supply chain. So the Allies decided to do something about it and put together an invasion of Iran in 1941. Ostensibly, this was to secure Iran's oil fields and preempt a possible Axis invasion. But the Allies also felt that Reza Shah was too pro-Nazi and that his young son, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, would be a friendlier ruler. The war only lasted six days, with the outgunned Iranians agreeing to surrender. Iran was occupied for the remainder of the war and aided the war effort but never actually declared war on either side. For some countries, the war was completely inconsequential. Bhutan and Yemen couldn't be more different as countries, but they had one thing in common. Both were able to stay fully neutral through the entirety of World War II. 
Bhutan, the small Himalayan kingdom, was partially under British control at the time but didn't get involved in the war and was never invaded. Yemen had been involved in conflict with the British around the same time period as well as a war with Saudi Arabia ten years earlier, but the Arab state was one of many in the region that managed to stay out of the war and never had it land on its own soil. Other countries like Saudi Arabia, Argentina, and Turkey stayed neutral until the last months of the war when they joined the Allies, but had little to no involvement in the ground wars that were tearing apart Europe and Asia at the time. But for some European countries, the path to neutrality was more complicated. For Ireland, World War II was complicated. While they were still technically a dominion of the British Empire, the Irish War of Independence 20 years earlier had given them much more autonomy. Notably, a British declaration of war did not bring them in as well. Their leader, Eamon de Valera, did not want any part of British conflicts and the public supported his calls for neutrality, despite there being more than 50,000 Irish citizens in the British Army. When Germany invaded Poland and World War II was on, Ireland stuck by its choice to stay neutral despite many saying they had a moral obligation to fight Nazis. The state chose not just to practice neutrality but to enforce it, with the government censoring activists that advocated entering the war and banning any actions that deemed to be belligerent. However, staying out of the war would prove to be complicated. Ireland could declare itself to be neutral, but it couldn't move itself out of the way of the war. The country had a few ships of its own, and the waters surrounding it were now a combat zone, making it difficult for the island to get supplied. German planes didn't discriminate, and several air raids hit the island. Ireland's ships were often attacked by both Allied and Axis forces as well. While de Valera was believed to be nominally pro-Allies, he resisted all pressure to join the war, even rejecting an offer by the British to support a united Ireland after the war in exchange for assistance. Ireland did successfully maintain its neutrality throughout the war, although the island paid a terrible price for its proximity to one of the most brutal battlefields. Today, most historians believe Ireland likely spared itself worse pain by avoiding the ire of the Nazis, although they have been criticized for their failure to provide aid to Jewish refugees. But one area of Europe surprisingly chose a very different path. Portugal might look like a small slice of land on the west coast of Iberia, but as the 1940s approached, it was still a global power and controlled colonies in Africa and Asia. They had historically been closely aligned with Britain, but as World War II ramped up, they chose to stay neutral, mostly due to their close proximity to Spain, who would align with the Axis powers. The 550-year Anglo-Portuguese alliance was strong, but Portugal was a small nation without their powerful domestic army needed to be a game-changer in the war. Thus, Portugal kept their eyes on the border, and with Spain on one side and the sea on the other, the Portuguese knew they needed to keep their neighbor happy. One key point of contention was the Azores, a small group of islands in the Atlantic controlled by Portugal that both sides believed would be a useful strategic location to build bases. But as the war raged on, neutral Portugal would have to make some hard decisions. Portugal was pulling off a tricky balancing act throughout the war. They'd signed a non-aggression pact with the new Spanish government in 1939, but were also providing vital aid to Britain. As only one of the English-friendly countries that weren't involved in the war, they were a source of credit and goods. They also provided a haven for refugees and maintained this delicate dance until 1944. Then, with the tide of the war turning, they agreed to let the United States establish a military base in the Azores. Well, this didn't force them to enter the war, it did change their status from neutral to non-belligerent. Throughout the war, both the Nazis and the Allies considered making moves against Portugal to secure its vital resources for themselves, but Portugal made themselves useful to all sides and it paid off, allowing their oceanfront homeland to escape the war intact. But right next door, the situation was much more complicated. Fascism was having a streak of success in Europe in the 1930s, and joining Hitler and Mussolini was General Francisco Franco, who led a nationalist revolt against the Second Spanish Republic and became a dictator in 1939. He quickly put the military in charge and began a brutal campaign of persecuting communists and other dissidents. As World War II ramped up, Franco seemed an ideal ally for Axis powers, but instead he chose to keep Spain out of the war. This wasn't for lack of interest. Franco wasn't willing to put Spanish troops on the line unless he got something in exchange, and Hitler wasn't interested in helping him establish colonies abroad. While he provided aid to the Axis powers in non-military ways, the Spanish army was mostly stationed around the country to deter the Nazis from taking a Spanish vacation once they'd conquered France. And much like Portugal, Spain was pulling off a tricky balancing act. Spain switched from neutral to non-belligerent to neutral through the war, and as the war shifted to the Eastern Front, Franco's forces became less important to the conflict. While the government was loosely aligned with the Axis, Allied pressure got them to limit exports to Germany in the later days of the war, and Franco could see the writing on the wall. While no Spanish troops were ever committed to the conflict, Franco did allow a division of volunteers to join the war on the side of the Axis, but only against the Soviets. 
keeping the delicate peace with Britain and the United States intact. Spain became a hub for espionage and escape during the war as one of the few countries on the European mainland not under Nazi occupation, and Franco's decision paid dividends for him while Mussolini was overthrown by his own people and Hitler died in a cold bunker as the Allies closed in on him, Franco remained in control until his death in 1975, and the fascist leader maintained a strong base of support, likely bolstered by his success in keeping the country out of the war. June 11, 1944, Matt Urban is with the 2nd Battalion, 60th Infantry, close to the war-torn beaches of Normandy, France. The Germans are throwing everything they've got at the Americans. It's chaos, and in the melee, a soldier carrying a bazooka goes down. Urban, who's no stranger to being on the losing end of a battle, picks up the bazooka and walks toward the advancing German tanks. His men can only look on in awe as they watch him walk through the smoke toward those giant machines. He takes two of them out, but is soon hit in the leg by shrapnel. Unfazed, he directs orders from a stretcher, moving his men toward the action. His motto? You never turn away from a fight. He would do this kind of thing time and again, walk right into the line of fire, gun blazing, his own blood staining his military fatigues. He suffered tremendously for his bravery, but he almost single-handedly won battles, and he saved countless soldiers' lives. Urban was possibly one of the most courageous soldiers the US has ever produced. He wasn't only insanely valiant, he was also a brilliant tactician. He could have died, he should have died on numerous occasions, but there's a reason he got the nickname The Ghost. He was unstoppable, and he could seemingly defy death. Time and again, he took out the enemy and somehow evaded being killed himself. That's why he became one of the most decorated American soldiers of all time. The Medal of Honor, Seven Purple Hearts, Silver Stars, the French Croix de Guerre, the American Campaign Medal, and others. This is his story. Born on August 25, 1919, Urban was brought up on the tough streets of Buffalo, New York. His family were regular blue-collar workers. There wasn't much cash to go around, but coming from a humble background no doubt set this person up to become the man he became. In high school, he succeeded in most sports and was a very proficient boxer. In 1937, he enrolled at Cornell University to study history. While there, he joined the Reserve Officers Training Corps, competing in its athletics and boxing competitions. His life was about to change forever. The world was about to change forever. War was on its way. November 8, 1942, Urban finds himself under fire for the first time in his life. He's part of what's called the Invasion of North Africa. He's fighting at the Battle of Port Lyote in French Morocco when something happens to Urban that will shape him into the fearless soldier he'll become. It's a vicious fight, with both sides seeing many casualties. Some of the American landing boats don't even make it to port. At one point, Urban finds himself in the middle of a battle, guns blazing all around him, smoke filling the air. Suddenly, he's standing in the midst of the chaos, holding the decapitated head of a comrade. He would later say that it was the shock he felt at the moment that motivated him to become a hero. The battle is won, and Urban is sent to Tunisia. There, he captures a German communications post almost by himself. He leads his men against the German army in the Battle of Kasserine Pass. His battalion holds off a German counterattack, and Urban is fierce as always. During the fight, his men are on the back foot, but Urban holds his ground. At one point, he grabs a German soldier and kills him with a trench knife. He then takes the dead man's pistol and rushes toward the Germans firing at him. All this doesn't come without injuries. Urban suffers seven different injuries from shrapnel, but of course he refuses to go back to the US to receive treatment. For his bravery, he later gets two silver stars, a bronze star, and two purple hearts. This is just the beginning of this man's death-defying actions in the army. He's then sent to Sicily, where he's given an order to take his unit across a mountainous trail so they can outflank German troops. 4,000 troops with their mules make the hazardous journey, and they mount a surprise attack on the Germans. The enemy has no choice but to retreat. Sicily is soon liberated, and Urban can add another silver star to his growing collection. Now we come to France and the beaches of Normandy. This is when Urban takes that bazooka and blasts two German tanks, saving many lives on the side of the Allies. Just a day later, Urban is hit by shrapnel. This time, it's more serious. His men try to convince him to get help, but as always, the stubborn Urban says he can go on. Tis but a scratch, he may or may not have told his men, but that doesn't matter anyway because he's hit again not long after. This time, it's even more serious and Urban has no choice but to go to England and receive treatment. So there he is, lying in a hospital bed in England, when he gets word that his men are not faring too well in Normandy. What should happen is Urban follows orders and returns to the US. His leg is in a really bad way. It gives him constant pain, and he can't walk without a cane. This doesn't stop him. 
he gets 40 guys together and they board a troop carrier and return to France. Once there, he hitchhikes to Utah Beach where his battalion is. When he arrives, he finds his men in a difficult position. They're taking heavy fire and are basically pinned down. It's now time for more heroics. Urban is informed that a US tank still has a driver in it. Two soldiers have already been killed by the Germans after trying to get into the turret and the 50 caliber machine gun. Under heavy fire, Urban crawls through the mud, making his way to the tank. When the others have failed, he succeeds. He gains control of the tank and orders the driver to head toward the Germans. Under fire from anti-tank artillery, Urban and the driver keep pressing ahead. Those who witness this can't believe their eyes. Here's a man that can hardly walk. A man that should be in a hospital bed, and he's blasting his way through German forces like he's both invisible and invincible. The guy is half crazy, say some men. It's as if he has no fear. It's then that they give him the nickname The Ghost, and The Ghost isn't done yet. He's just starting. After reaching enemy lines in his tank, Urban's men gain confidence. They pick up their guns and run toward the Germans. What ensues is a fight for life, hand-to-hand -hand combat in bayonet fighting between US and German troops. Buoyed by the brutal strength of their commander, the American troops overwhelm the Germans. The white flag is held up. The enemy is defeated. All this is being watched from a distance. 2nd Battalion Commander Max L. Wolf has been standing at a far-off command post watching the fight through his binoculars. He can't believe what he just witnessed. One man has pretty much led his men to victory in a battle they looked certain to lose. Wolf soon recommends Urban for the Medal of Honor, not just for showing incredible bravery, but for saving the lives of a battalion that looked sure to die. This is what was later written about Urban's actions and why he was recommended for the medal. Urban moved forward, and damned if the US Army didn't move forward also. He bellied up to the tank, and amid heavy gunfire scrambled aboard and manned the machine gun. The driver took heart with Urban aboard, the tank roared forward, and Urban tore the hillside apart with that gun. The men, once again with Urbanitis, scrambled up the rise and gained the objective. So does Urban return home, collect his medal, and bask in the warmth of his country's appreciation? Hell no, he fights on, even with a seriously damaged leg. Around a week later, he gets injured again, this time by a shell fragment that just misses his heart. Does he return home when asked? You know the answer to that. His admirer, Wolf, is taken out by the Germans, so the 24-year-old Urban assumes command of the 2nd Battalion. Believe it or not, he gets wounded yet again by shrapnel, but he manages to stay with his unit. That unit receives the French Croix de Guerre, and now it's time for Urban to raise hell over in Belgium. This is where he really should die. God knows how he didn't. He's fighting against the Germans with his battalion in a place called Philippeville. There, they've discovered a fairly large, well-equipped German unit. When Urban and his men finally get the aircraft cover they requested, they advance toward the German troops. Not one to shy away from a fight, Urban runs at the Germans. His objective is to take out a machine gun nest, but to do that he has to get close. Armed with two grenades, he runs toward the emplacement. His men watch in wonder, and then in horror, as their commander takes a bullet to the neck. Urban's now lying on the floor, trying to staunch a river of blood seeping from his neck. The unused grenades lie at his side. His life force diminishes. Luckily for him, some of his men manage to drag him through the mud and take him to a place of safety. There, they patch him up best they can as bullets rain over their heads. A doctor arrives at the scene. He administers blood to Urban and performs a tracheotomy so he can breathe. Until then, Urban was gurgling blood, looking like his days were numbered. He's in such a bad way that when the chaplain arrives, he's read his last rites. The doctor approves, saying this man has seen his last fight. But we're talking about a man called Ghost. Ghosts don't die easily. Urban knocks on death's door a few times during his recovery, but in a hospital in France, he gets over the worst of it. In England, he receives more treatment, and a man that looked as good as dead comes back to life. And no, he doesn't go home to the US, you should know that by now. Instead, he gets the green light in Scotland to go back to his battalion. His men are over the moon to see him because no one thought he could have survived that neck wound. It's as if they're looking at a ghost. There is a slight problem when it comes to leading his men, he can't actually speak. He asks the higher-ups if he can take a combat assignment and if he can do that using writing, not speaking. This is a bridge too far for his infantry regiment commander. He's told he can stay with his men for a while, but no more big fights. It's time to hang up your gloves, the commander tells him. Urban retired from the military in 1947 to concentrate on sports coaching, especially boxing. He trained a bunch of young men and helped them to become national Golden Gloves champions. He even trained Cassius Clay for a while, the man that would become Muhammad Ali, possibly the greatest fighter that ever lived. Urban could talk in those days, but his damaged vocal cords gave him quite a raspy voice. The ghost died in 1995, age 75. The cause of death was a collapsed lung, a consequence of the injuries he'd received in the war.
This video is sponsored by Call of War, the free online PvP strategy game where you'll choose a real country to lead during World War II. It's the darkest hours of human history and it's up to you to build a powerful army to defend the country. You'll fight up to 100 other players on historic maps in real-time games that can take weeks to complete. What I really love about Call of War is the variety of technological paths you can go down. Do you want to tank rush your enemies or keep them suppressed with your air superiority? You can even focus on the development of secret weapons like nuclear bombers and V2 rockets. It's your choice. We'll be hosting a special game with instructions on how to join at the end of this video, so make sure you stick around. Infographics show viewers will also get a special gift of 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free when they use the link. It's only available for 30 days, so click the link, choose a country, and start fighting in the ultimate confrontation right now. It was the immediate aftermath of World War II, and a large group of European citizens was being brought to the United States. But these weren't war refugees or immigrants, they were members of the Axis powers and insiders in one of the most notorious regimes of all time. So why did the United States government roll out the red carpet for more than a thousand Nazis? It was 1945, and the genesis of what would become Operation Paperclip was starting in the Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. The war was starting to wind down, with victory in Europe looking all but assured, and the US and British armies wanted to make sure that the valuable resources and innovations created by Nazi Germany wouldn't be lost with the regime's defeat. They created T-Force, a joint army mission to secure any scientific and technological targets before they were destroyed either by the Nazis or by looters and invading armies. This mission would grab rocket technology, aircraft and naval equipment, and synthetic rubber and oil catalysts. But there was another target of T-Force – people. The German war machine employed countless scientists in industrial technology, weapons design, rocketry and nuclear technology research. While Germany lost the war due to Hitler's poor decision-making and sabotage of his own war machine, leading some of his top military men to scheme to kill him at one point, the Nazis had been in a tense race with the Americans to develop the nuclear bomb and employed some of the smartest and most dangerous scientists in the world. And the United States had a reason to get them in their custody. While the war wasn't quite over yet, the minds of many top American military experts were already turning to the war that was just around the corner, the Cold War. The Soviet Union was one of the few countries that had been on both sides of the war, aligning with Hitler and then joining forces with the Allies after being invaded by the Nazi army. And they would come out of the war more powerful and influential than ever. In the aftermath of post-war negotiations, they would gain control of much of Eastern Europe and half of the divided Germany and would become the primary superpower challenging America. The space race was just around the corner, but first would come the brain race. As Hitler's regime fell, many of the high-ranking scientists working for the Nazi regime found themselves falling out of favor. Hitler was notorious for turning on his allies due to paranoia, and prominent figures like rocket scientist Werner von Braun found themselves on the run and branded traitors. That created an opportunity. And on July 20, 1945, the US military officially greenlit Operation Overcast, a mission to recruit German scientists and use their know-how to help end the war in Japan. It would be renamed Operation Paperclip months later, denoting the signature paperclip the officers would use to mark the files of the scientists they planned to recruit. But it was about to become a much bigger project. In 1946, the Nazi regime had scattered to the winds. Many of the regime's top officials had either killed themselves or been arrested to face war crimes trials, but the scientists were often in a gray area. Many either worked isolated from the most brutal crimes of the regime or had limited involvement. They weren't targets for war crimes prosecution, but many of them were still arrested and found themselves in military custody. That made them easy targets for recruitment, and President Harry Truman allowed for the recruitment of more than a thousand German scientists and they had some unintended help from Nazi Germany's leaders. After the failed conquest of Russia in 1941, Germany shifted its focus to building their technology for the war ahead. When they first instituted the draft, countless scientists and intellectuals were taken from their work and turned into genetic soldiers. This was not good for their science division. And in 1943, the head of their military research division, Werner Ossenberg, composed a list of scientists and engineers who could be more useful in research work. This document, the Ossenberg List, was later found by a Polish laboratory worker and made its way to MI6. The Allies now had a useful list of the smartest people put to work by the Nazis. But recruiting them would come with no small amount of controversy. As the full scope of Nazi Germany's war crimes became clear, many were hesitant to collaborate in any way with its architects. Defenders of the program argued that the scientists likely had little to do with the horrors of the death camps, but many scientists, including von Braun, used slave labor to build the German war machine. President Truman was reportedly hesitant to approve it, but felt that the growing threat of the Soviet Union was more important. But as they arrived in America, many of the German scientists came under new scrutiny. 
Had the United States made a deal with the devil? Several scientists who were brought to the United States were later accused of having more involvement with Nazis' crimes than thought. George Rickey worked as an engineer at one of Nazi Germany's largest factories and was responsible for the production of several of the country's most powerful bombs. After being brought to the US as part of Operation Paperclip, he was accused of close ties with the SS and Gestapo and getting many of his workers from a nearby concentration camp. He became the only Operation Paperclip recruit to be returned to Germany for trial, and after being acquitted at the trial for lack of evidence, never returned to the US. But another recruit had even more shocking skeletons in his closet. Walter Schreiber was one of the later recruits of Operation Paperclip coming to the US in 1951. He gained the Americans' attention after escaping Russian custody, but was one of the Nazis' top medical scientists. He worked in medical research for the Air Force, but not long after a shocking bombshell dropped. A Holocaust survivor accused him of being involved in medical experiments committed at the notorious Ravensbrück concentration camp. If the allegations were confirmed earlier, he likely would have been tried at Nuremberg. Instead, his career with the US came to an unceremonious end, and he chose to leave for Argentina. But many of the other Operation Paperclip recruits had much more storied careers in the US. The US military had one primary focus for their recruitment – aerospace technology. Getting better, faster, and more precise aircraft was essential for any future wars. But the focus was just as much on the next frontier. It would be only 12 years after World War II when the first satellite was launched into space by the Russians, and the space race would be on in earnest. Many of the German scientists had made massive leaps forward in rocket technology, and the government wasted no time putting them to work. It was this field where Operation Paperclip would bear its biggest fruit. Werner von Braun wasted no time in getting to work for the United States. He had already been out of favor with Hitler and was on the run when he was captured by Americans. He would be joined by other German talents, including aircraft designer Herbert Wagner, the first scientist recruited by the program, and Kurt Debus, Arthur Rudolph, Hermann Oberth, and Eberhard Ries, pioneering rocket engineers, all claimed to be apolitical scientists glad to turn their back on Nazi Germany, although many Holocaust experts questioned that description. But the US wasn't the only ones with their sights on these scientists. Starting in October 1946, the Soviet Union began their own counterpart to Operation Paperclip, Operation Osoaviakim, which recruited over 2,000 German scientists and specialists, along with 4,000 civilian family members. Witnesses described this operation as fast and efficient, resembling a draft more than a recruitment. A scientist named Fritz Preichscott described being rounded up by Russian soldiers with machine guns and taken to Russia to work, something he would tell to the US military in 1952 after being released from his Russian duties and being recruited by the Americans, making him the only person to work on both sides of the space race. But for most of the American recruits, it would be a shocking change in fortunes. Werner von Braun and other scientists wasted no time in getting to work for the Americans, and they proved to be worth the recruitment efforts. The knowledge of the German rocketry and airplane technology they brought with them was quickly incorporated into American designs, and many of them gained prominent positions. Von Braun worked on sensitive projects including both the American ballistic missile program and the rockets that launched the first American space satellite, Explorer 1. And an even more prominent organization was about to come calling. It was 1960 and the focus of the space race was shifting from breaching the atmosphere to putting human beings safely in space, and eventually on the moon. Von Braun was considered America's foremost expert on space technology, and his research group was incorporated into NASA. Not long after, his fellow former Nazi scientist Kurt Debus would become the first director of NASA's Launch Operations Center. Von Braun and Debus were involved in the design and launch of the Apollo program and eventually oversaw the successful mission that put Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the moon. But they were also involved in far more sensitive projects. The first nuclear bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were delivered in a very analog way – dropped out of manned aircraft. But as the Cold War ramped up and the nuclear arms race escalated, it became clear the United States would need a better, faster way to deliver their deadliest weapons. Von Braun quickly named Debus to organize a division on missile firing, and in the early 1950s they tested the first missiles carrying nuclear warheads, deploying the powerful weapons into the Pacific Ocean in a shocking display of Cold War weaponry. The two scientists were the crown jewels of Operation Paperclip and received surprising accolades. Both worked for the US government until they retired and were highly honored by the end of their careers. Von Braun was inducted into the National Academy of Engineering and received the National Medal of Science. Debus had an award named after him after the National Space Club of Florida and even had a lunar crater named after him. Many scientists believe they helped the United States in the race to the moon, but for many people they never quite outraced their past. The question of the guilt of the Operation Paperclip scientists has been debated for a long time, with Von Braun and Debus getting extra scrutiny. 
While Debus mostly worked in flight tests and rocket research and sought out US forces on his own, many say that no one in the Nazi war machine didn't benefit from the regime's extensive use of slave labor. Von Braun is a more controversial case, running large factories that were heavily staffed by slave labor. While he wasn't directly implicated in any war crimes, survivors who were forced to work for him spoke of the harsh treatment they experienced. There were many skeletons in the closets of the recruits, and some came out long after the fact. Arthur Rudolph was one of Germany's top rocketry engineers and a close ally of Werner von Braun. Much of his work took place at the Middlework Factory, a notorious site staffed by prisoners from the Middlebau Dora concentration camp. He eventually defected to the US and British forces and was incorporated into the post-war US team, despite concerns over his background check, which described him as an enthusiastic Nazi loyalist. He worked on both the US ballistic missile program and on the Saturn V rocket under von Braun. He was highly decorated and considered one of the program's most successful recruits, but his story would have a much darker ending. It was 1979 when Eli Rosenbaum, who worked in a US office investigating Nazi war criminals, came across Rudolph's name in a book. It described him as a frequent user of slave labor, and research indicated that he had been involved in the abuse of prisoners. Rudolph was called in for an interview and interrogated on his past actions and loyalty to Nazi Germany. It was decided that in exchange for the government not prosecuting him, he would give up his US citizenship and return to Germany. In 1983, he left the United States, becoming a black eye on the face of Operation Paperclip. The program's legacy remains complicated even today. The scientists of Operation Paperclip are all long gone. None were young when recruited, and most died before the dawn of the 21st century. But they built much of the infrastructure of NASA and the United States ballistic missile program, and many are uncomfortable with that. When a major news outlet posted a tweet referring to Werner von Braun as a brilliant German-American rocket engineer, no shortage of angry people on Twitter reminded them that he was in fact a Nazi. The Cold War made for unlikely allies, few more unlikely than the 1600 scientists and engineers recruited by the US military. But history moves fast, and many people were willing to look past their actions in the last war if it meant winning the next. Thanks again to our sponsor Call of War, the free online PvP strategy game set during World War II. We've set up a special game for our viewers. Click the link in the description, create an account, and enter the game code infographics and password infographics to join today. While spending any amount of time locked up in confinement is brutal for anybody, it's especially so for prisoners of war, who are now at the mercy of the people that just days or even moments before they were trying to kill. History is filled with tales of brutality toward captured opponents, and there's a wide variety of punishments that can be meted out for those unfortunate enough to fall into the hands of the enemy. One of those punishments can simply be the length of time itself for prisoners to be released, such as in the Vietnam War, where US POWs sometimes waited for six, seven, and even eight years before being returned to their homeland. While these times might seem impossibly long for many, they actually do not come anywhere close to the longest time someone has actually been held as a prisoner of war. That dubious record is held by a man named Andras Toma, who is a private in the Hungarian army and was captured by the Russians in World War II, going on to spend 55 years in captivity. But how does a private, the lowest ranking enlisted man, stay locked up for decades after the war? especially when the most senior leadership of Germany and other Axis countries were all released within a decade of the end of World War II. In the final six months of World War II, the situation in Europe was characterized by large, chaotic battles and an incredibly fluid front line. By the fall of 1944, the situation in the East was not looking good for the Germans and their allies. Massive Soviet offensives finally pushed enemy soldiers off Russian soil for the first time since 1941, and now the Russians were advancing in all directions along the front. Here begins Toma's story. Toma was born in a small village called Uefeherto in 1925 and grew up in the village of Shulianbokor. During his time in the village, he grew up with both his parents as well as one brother and sister. Toma attended school in the small town and after graduation became a blacksmith apprentice. It was here in the autumn of 1944 that army recruiters came looking for him and forced him into the army. Little is known about his service in the Hungarian army, which was allied with Hitler during the war. He likely participated in the defense of Niris Haza, a larger Hungarian town not far from his childhood village. From there it appears that his unit was sent to Poland. There are differing accounts on when exactly he was captured, with some believing it was in the late fall of 1944, while some other accounts cite January 11, 1945 as the day of his capture in Poland. 
From the moment he was captured, Toma's ordeal was a living hell. It's likely that the Soviets rounded up survivors of his unit and marched them to one of a series of over 4,000 specially designed camps made exclusively for prisoners of war. Often the guards were brutal and were known to beat and kick prisoners who were falling behind or for no reason at all. From here, the men were likely put on crowded boxcars with up to 60 men in each car. The beds along the walls were usually only two deep, meaning those unlucky enough to not get one would have to sleep on the floor or stand up aimlessly for hours until it was their turn for a break. There was usually a stove in the middle of the car, but fuel was scarce so the prisoners would freeze in the cold winter months, like when Tomo was captured. As for a bathroom, a small hole in the floor of the car was all that was provided. Making matters worse was the intense pressure to get the prisoners to their final destination as quickly as possible. The guards were under strict orders to provide the exact numbers of the prisoners reported and because of that would make few stops for food and water along the way. During these rare moments, it was common for POWs to try and escape, but these men were always met with immediate gunfire from the guards in any such case. The pressure to keep the exact number of prisoners also meant that whenever someone died or escaped, the guards would arrest any local citizens and take them along now as prisoners of war, ensuring that the car stays packed the entire way there. During the journey, it was here that the once perfectly sane Toma began to show his first signs of mental illness. It was reported that because of the intense timeline to get to the camps as scheduled, those that died in the car from their wounds, disease, thirst, or who were shot simply stayed in the car. Because of the lack of beds, prisoners like Toma were forced to sleep on top of the bodies of their dead comrades. By the time the men reached Russia, Toma had already begun to show the first sign of mental psychosis. Regardless of when he was captured, the first records of his captivity come from a prisoner of war camp outside Leningrad on January 25, 1945. Upon arrival, it was likely that he was sent to the camp infirmary to see a medical doctor to address the mental breakdown he'd suffered on the trip. It was this day that would send him down the path toward his decades-long internment. While presenting himself to the medical officer, he told him that his name was Andras Toma. But because of the language barrier, misunderstanding, or even poor handwriting, his name was recorded as Andras Tamas, and this would be his new identity for years to come. Compounding matters even worse was the fact that he was now one of the few Hungarians captured in a mostly German unit, meaning he was left with few others to communicate with since he spoke no German and very little Russian. His time at the prisoner of war camp was likely very tough. At the end of World War II, Stalin had told the other world leaders that because of the incredible casualties his country had suffered during the war, he intended to keep prisoners of war for as long as he could as forced laborers to rebuild the nation. Over 4 million foreign prisoners were used for forced labor by the Soviets, including at least 500,000 Hungarians. The prisoners were utilized for a variety of projects, which usually consisted of construction or other manual labor jobs, to rebuild the damaged infrastructure of the Soviet Union. It's unknown which camps Toma served in since the record for the times were sparse at best. To further complicate matters, these records were kept under the seal in the Russian archives until as recently as only a few years ago, when the Hungarian government received permission from the Russian government to unseal the records of over 400,000 Hungarians who had survived captivity in the Soviet Union. While it's unknown exactly which camp or camps Toma served in, they were all without a doubt miserable places to be. For one, upon arrival, the men were forced to give up their valuables. These would either be pocketed by the guards or given to the local population, since they were often in little better shape than the prisoners. After arrival, men would be expected to work at least 8 but sometimes up to 14 hours a day. The punishments for escape could be brutal, with some camps giving immediate death sentences for anyone who tried. But if Toma could have escaped, the locals were all told that even the Hungarians were war criminals and were just as bad as the Germans, meaning little hope of someone taking pity on them. The food in the camps was also universally poor, with many Hungarians reporting that most meals consisted of dry bread and some watered-down soup. The men's uniforms were reduced to rags and fuel here was just as scarce on the transports in the winter. Often prisoners would become infected with lice and other vermin, adding another layer of misery to the whole ordeal. At the end of 1947, Soviet records showed that his camp was shut down and he was transferred to a Soviet psychiatric hospital in central Russia since the Russians claimed he was schizophrenic but was likely suffering from PTSD from the years of abuse in the camps. For unknown reasons, his name was struck from the official list of Hungarian prisoners at this point, and Toma would now begin the next chapter of his internment living in obscurity. Once at the hospital, Toma tried to communicate with the staff and fellow patients numerous times, both by speaking and writing, but every time he was met with cold indifference. His native tongue is unlike any other language in Europe and shares few common roots with any one of them, 
making Hungarian a very unique and difficult to understand language for those who are not familiar with it. Thomas' fate would be locked in after 1954. When the last batches of POWs were released, he was officially declared dead by the Hungarian government, since his last name was no longer on the list of confirmed POWs still alive. During the decades Thomas spent at the hospital, he spent practically every moment alone. He ate his meals while staring at the wall and worked some small jobs in the hospital to keep himself occupied. Because of the repeated attempts at communication failing, Toma resigned himself to his fate and carried on each day hoping that one day someone would be able to understand him. That day would take over 50 years. By 2000, new staff at the hospital decided that they'd attempt to communicate with Toma. They did not believe that the language he was speaking was some made-up gibberish, as other doctors had claimed. They sought the help of one of Russia's most renowned linguists to listen to him to see if he could identify the language. After listening to Toma, the linguist immediately identified the language as Hungarian and soon thereafter contacted the Hungarian embassy. After positively identifying that he was Hungarian and not mentally disabled, the work of identifying who he was proved difficult. Toma had not had a prolonged conversation with anyone in over 50 years. Getting him to come out of his shell was slow at first, but once several officers from the Hungarian army came to visit him, he began to open up more about his past. While it was hard to understand what he was saying since he spoke an older, less used dialect of Hungarian, the officers and medical staff began to piece together facts of his life before the war. They then solicited information from the public and over 100 families came forward believing he could be one of their long-lost relatives. In the end, through a DNA test, one of those families proved to be his actual relatives. It was his brother and sister who had survived the war and were still living in the same village they'd grown up in. Toma, after 55 years in captivity, was finally returned to his native Hungary to a hero's welcome and 55 years of back pay for service in the army. But he would not have much time to catch up with his family or enjoy the celebrity status and back pay given to him by the Hungarian government. Sadly, in 2004, just over four years after he's released, he passed away at home. This episode is brought to you by Skillshare. The first thousand people to sign up using the link in the description will get their first two months free. The Battleship ruler of the high seas up until and throughout much of World War II. With their combat roles escorting convoys to vital gunfire support to troops ashore, the battleship and battlecruiser played a central role in any nation's navy. So what were the mega ships that made up World War II's military machinery? That's what we'll find out today in this episode of the Infographic Show, Top 10 World War II Battleships and Battlecruisers. Number 10. One of four Admiral-class battlecruisers ordered in mid-1916 and commissioned in 1920, the HMS Hood was the last battlecruiser built for the Royal Navy. Named after the 18th century Admiral Samuel Hood, this ship had some design limitations, though it was revised and some improvements were made after the Battle of Jutland. In terms of the specifications, the hood was 860 feet long, had a beam of 104 feet, draft was 33 feet, and surface displacement 49,140 tons. It was propelled by 24 Yarrow small tube oil-fired boilers and four Brown Curtis single reduction geared quadruple screw steam turbines, delivering 144,000 shaft horsepower to four shafts, generating a surface speed of 29 knots, which is 33 miles per hour, and giving the ship a range of 50 399 nautical miles. Number 9, the Tennessee class was a class of battleships of the United States Navy which comprised two ships, Tennessee and California. They were modified versions of the New Mexico class featuring improved underwater torpedo protection and 30 degree elevation on their main batteries. Both ships survived World War II but had been badly damaged during the attack on Pearl Harbor and though some restoration work was carried out, they had to be scrapped shortly after. This class of ships was 624 feet long and able to hold a crew of 1,080 people. The beam was 97 feet, draft 30 feet, and surface displacement 37,200 tons. Propulsion was by turbo-electric transmission arrangement producing 26,800 shaft horsepower and driving four shafts which was able to move this big hunk of metal at 21 knots giving it a range of 7,995 nautical miles. Number 8. The French also had a large battleship during World War II, Jean Bart, named for the 17th century seaman, privateer, and corsair, Jean Bart. She was the second Richelieu-class battleship and designed to fight the new battleships of the Italian Navy. At the time, their speed, shielding, armament, and overall technology were second to none. Maximum crew was 1,200 in this 813-foot ship. She had a beam of 115 feet, 
draft of 31.5 feet, and a surface displacement of 35,000 tons. She was propelled by six Indrit Searle boilers with four Parsons gear turbines that delivered 150,000 horsepower to four shafts. This produced a surface speed of 32 knots, providing a range of 7,669 nautical miles. Number 7. On the subject of the Italian Navy, there's the battleship Roma. She was named after two previous ships and the city of Rome. Roma was deployed as the flagship of Admiral Carlo Bergamini in a large battle group that eventually comprised the three Vittorio Venetos, eight cruisers, and eight destroyers. She was sunk on September 9, 1943 by a German plane in an attack which killed 1,253 sailors with only 596 people surviving. The wreck was discovered in 2012 by an underwater robot named Pluto Pala, designed by Italian engineer Guido Gay. The ship was sitting on the seabed at a depth of around 3,300 feet. At full capacity, the Roma could carry 1,920 crew, she was 790 feet in length, with a 108-foot beam, draft of 31 feet, and surface displacement of 46,215 tons. Propulsion was by eight Yarrow boilers, feeding four steam turbines, developing 128,000 horsepower, and driving four shafts. This provided a surface speed of 30 knots and a range of 4,580 nautical miles. Number six, Congo, was known as the Indestructible Diamond. She was a warship of the Imperial Japanese Navy during World War I and World War II, and was the first battle cruiser of the Congo class among the most heavily armed ships in any navy when built. Her designer was the British naval engineer George Thurston. The Congo was torpedoed and sunk by the submarine USS Sea Lion while transitioning the Formosa Strait on November 21, 1944. She was the only Japanese battleship sunk by submarine in the Second World War. British newspaper The Telegraph reported in February this year that Japanese researchers believe they may have found the wreckage of the Congo at a depth of more than 1,300 feet, partly covered in sand and debris. Sonar images show a vessel standing 16 feet proud of the seabed. This ship carried 1,201 crew and was a length of 692 feet. The beam was 91 feet, draft at 27 feet, surface displacement 26,230 tons. She was propelled by four shaft Parsons turbine and 10 boilers, topping a surface speed of 27 and a half knots with a range of 8,000 nautical miles. Number five, Bismarck was the first of two Bismarck-class battleships built for Nazi Germany's Kriegsmarine. Named after Chancellor Otto von Bismarck, the Bismarck and her sister ship Tirpitz were the largest battleships ever built by Germany and two of the largest built by any European power. On the morning of May 27th, the King George V and the Rodney, in an hour-long attack, incapacitated the Bismarck and an hour and a half later, it sank after being hit by three torpedoes from the cruiser Dorsetshire. Only about 110 of the crew survived. She was 824 feet long with a crew of 2,192. The beam was 118 feet, draft 32 feet, surface displacement was 50,900 tons. She was propelled by 12 Wagner high pressure steam heated boilers with three shaft blome and Voss geared steam turbines delivering 150,000 horsepower while delivering three shafts which produced a surface speed of 30 knots and a range of 8,099 nautical miles. Number four. Admiral Graf Spee was a German battleship that served with the Kriegsmarine of Nazi Germany during World War II. It was nicknamed a pocket battleship by the British. The Graf Spee was named after Admiral Maximilian von Spee, commander of the East Asia Squadron that fought the battles of Coronel and the Falkland Islands in World War I. In terms of her specifications, the Graf Spee had a crew of 1150 and she was 610 feet long. The beam was 70 feet, draft 19 feet. Her surface displacement was 16,200 tons, and propulsion was provided by eight man diesel nine-cylinder engines, delivering two shafts at 56,000 shaft horsepower, which ensured a surface speed of 28 knots and a range of 8,909 nautical miles. Number three, it's back to Japan next with the Fuso, the lead ship of the two Fuso-class dreadnought battleships that was built for the Imperial Japanese Navy. She was launched in 1914 and commissioned in 1915 and initially patrolled off the coast of China. In 1923, she assisted survivors of the Great Kanto Earthquake. Then, between 1930 and 1935, and again in 1937 to 1941, the Fuso was modernized with improvements to her armor and her propulsion machinery. She could carry 1,198 crew with a length of 673 feet. Her beam was 94 feet, 
draft 28 feet, surface displacement was 36,500 tons, propulsion was provided by 24 Miyahara water tube boilers with two brown Curtis steam turbines developing 40,000 horsepower to four shafts. Refit, six water tube boilers with four steam turbines developing 75,000 horsepower to four shafts, which resulted in a surface speed of 23 knots and a range of 11,818 nautical miles. Number two, the USS Iowa is the lead ship of her class of battleship and the fourth in the United States Navy to be named after the state of Iowa. Iowa is the last lead ship of any class of United States battleships and was the only ship of her class to have served in the Atlantic Ocean during World War II. The Iowa has a colorful history that includes carrying President Franklin Roosevelt across the Atlantic to meet with Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin and bombing the Marshall Islands and Japan during World War II, bombing North Korea during the Korean War, and escorting oil tankers during the Iran-Iraq War. She is 887 feet long and could carry 1,921 crew, has a beam of 108 feet, a draft of 38 feet, her surface displacement was 48,500 tons, and she was propelled by eight water tube boilers with four General Electric geared steam turbines, delivering 212,000 horsepower to four shafts, creating a surface speed of 33 knots, which provided a range of 12,948 nautical miles. And finally, number one. As we've seen, the Japanese were known for having some awesome battleships, and the IJN Yamato was top of the class. She was the lead ship of battleships built for the Imperial Japanese Navy shortly before World War II. She and her sister ship Musashi were the heaviest and most powerfully armed battleships ever constructed, displacing 72,800 tons at full load and armed with nine 18-inch Type 94 main guns, which were the largest guns ever mounted on a warship. Yamato was designed to counter the numerically superior battleship fleet of the United States, Japan's main rival in the Pacific, and her end came in dramatic fashion, as on her last mission, she was involved in a suicide attack against American beachheads. Over 3,000 sailors died when she exploded and sank well short of her goal. She had 2,767 crew, was 801 feet long, had a beam of 121 feet, a draft of 36 feet, her surface displacement was 72,800 tons, propulsion provided by 12 Campon boilers feeding four shaft geared steam turbines, developing 150,000 shaft horsepower while driving four three-bladed propellers which ensured a surface speed of 27 knots and a range of 6,210 nautical miles. This all sounded quite technical, didn't it? If you have patience for so much detail, and you're a bit creative, we suggest you channel your talent into something cool like clay animation. But how does one even get started? Well, we know just the right class for that, and it's called Introduction to Clay Animation for Beginners. This class is offered by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community offering classes in leadership, photography, productivity, and more. Premium membership will give you unlimited access to topics that will improve your skills and in the process your life. The first 1,000 people to sign up by visiting Skillshare.com slash Infographics33 or by clicking the link in the description will receive two months of Skillshare absolutely free. Join Skillshare and start learning today. That's some pretty awesome battleships, but then again, we only touched on 10. Do you know other ships that are worth a mention? Be sure to let us know in the comments. Also, don't forget to watch our other video called 10 Most Powerful Tanks. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time.